Jack Dorsey has himself said that if the full email chains, if I was a journalist and I was tasked with doing something like this, I'm never in my entire life gonna write a story about a company based solely on the information the company gives me. I am never going into Exxon's offices, having one of their engineers show me what they've done and then publishing a story on Exxon's platform released on their website about Exxon. That's called PR. I find that like wild and also offensive. Like, do you think we have no integrity? At any point in any of these Twitter threads, was anybody from the FBI contacted and asked for comment? So did you ever reach out to Michael uh, Kratzios or whatever? Is that how you pronounce his name? <clears throat> so you're right, I wish I'd, I wish I had done that. Um, that's, I think, I, I think I'm totally with you on that. 85% of the people that read the Twitter profile, or I'm sorry, the Twitter files, came away the exact opposite opinion that I have. We're not responsible for what people conclude on Twitter based on like a cursory reading of what, all we're responsible for is what we reported in this stuff. There was a, there've been a series of leaks from Twitter with, under this assumption that Elon Musk came in, bought it, and Twitter is this big bad guy with these bad people that are working with the bad intelligence community. And the IC is pressuring Twitter to censor stories and censor conservatives and try to mold the media landscape in a way that's favorable to Democrats intentionally. That feels like the overall kind of broad narrative that the Twitter files is trying to push. And more specifically, when we come to uh, the Hunter Biden stuff, I think it was the Twitter files, I think seven. Um, but when, when all of these tweets started to go down, the idea was that, um, the Michael Schellenberger guy was essentially saying that the uh, the intelligence community was intentionally trying to censor this Hunter Biden story before it came out. They managed to discredit it. Uh, Twitter sent him an email back saying, job well done. Uh, we got the Hunter Biden story discredited. Good job, you know, high fives to everybody. When I go through the actual evidence that's presented, I don't see any bombshells. I don't see any smoking guns. What I see is like a Twitter internal community that's genuinely struggling to figure out how to moderate their content. I see an intelligence community that's genuinely worried about repeating 2016. And I see everybody trying to do their best, sometimes unfortunately making missteps. I think the Hunter Biden story probably was. I think Jack admitted as much. But um, I just don't see like the maliciousness that um, it feels like Schellenberger is trying to communicate with his points. That's Broadly speaking, that's kind of where I'm at. And then, yeah, you can go from there. Cool. So, well, just to give everyone context, um, you know, Layton uh, and David, maybe you guys can just quickly introduce you yourselves. Oh, yeah, yeah, and go for it. Explain people sure. like, which Twitter files you worked on. We can see you now, David, by the way. Oh, uh -huh. awesome. All right. Hey, <laughs> cool. Um, uh, well, I'll start. I Michael Schellenberger is my, uh, is my business partner. We have a publication together called Public. Mm -hmm. um, so I were, uh, David and I were, of course, both in the room at Twitter, um, but I worked um, closely with Michael on the Hunter Biden laptop stuff, so I could speak to that, mm -hmm. um, as well as generally on, on, on the other threads as well. Um, David can speak for himself, but he focused more on the COVID stuff. Right. Yeah, I was there with Leighton, Michael Schellenberger, and Lee Fong. Um, so it was the four of us while I was there. I think, I don't know, Leighton, were you there additional day? I know Schellenberger has been there yeah. many additional days. I don't know what your schedule was, but I was there for three days. I was there with, I was there for a little longer because I lived in the Bay Area. So I was here with, <laughs> there with, uh, with Barry and, and Matt Saibi and, right. and as well. Yeah. Um, can I speak to your uh, characterization of the Twitter files because I, I I don't agree with it. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so I think that um, what you I think you describe well what people in the sort of the discourse uh, that's their perception of the Twitter files. I don't believe that that's what we argued, nor do I believe it's the way that we see it. So first of all, I don't think that. The, those of us who are participating in this reporting were pushing a narrative in, in, in your language. I think that we were reporting on what we were seeing in the Twitter files and describing um, what was happening behind the scenes. Nor do I think that we were um, portraying people at Twitter as necessarily the villains. Um, in some cases, yes, I think that some of the, 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 the some of the executives of Twitter um, were acting in bad faith, um, specifically Jim Baker, who's the former um, deputy chief counsel for the FBI. Um, uh, I'm sorry, chief counsel for the FBI, who became deputy chief counsel for Twitter. Um, but there are other people, like for example, Yoel Roth has become kind of famous because of the Twitter files, and he's often presented as this malicious actor. But but I don't think that that's what our reporting 
um, uh, showed. As a matter of fact, I think Yol Roth is somewhat of, a, of an unsung hero in this story uh, because he was the one who's like specifically, for example, on the Hunter Biden laptop story, he was the one who said there's nothing here. And and frequently he was in also the same with Hamilton 68, the stuff that Taibbi recently reported on. He was the one who was saying there's nothing here. This is this is this is, um, you know, every time in the Hamilton 68 case, um, every time uh, the, these Democrats are complaining about something that they disagree with, that's in the discourse, they point to the Russians. He was saying this. Um, so I think that there I think you're right that there was a lot of internal pushback within Twitter. I think that there was a complex dynamic happening. So, for example, within Twitter, Yal Roth was con- was was pretty consistently um, uh, uh, pushing back against the idea of this stuff being Russian trolls and then was being overruled by Jim Baker frequently, especially with the Hunter Biden laptop thing. So it's, I think it's a much more complex picture of what was happening. Um, but uh, but I think that those, those complexities are, are very important in terms of, uh, you know, free speech. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> OK, so before we get into this too deep, um, let me define when I say narrative. When I say narrative, people use these words in different ways, right? Um, Narrative is like a way to paint the entirety of kind of what's happened when I say it. So, for instance, um, if there was like a conspiracy to commit a crime or something, I might say like the narrative is that like this guy was poor. He was looking for money. He made uh, plans with some friends to go and rob a bank, right? That was like the overall narrative. I don't necessarily mean to imply that narrative in and of itself is a false or bad thing. We all kind of need narratives. I just want to get that out there. Um, So, and then the second thing, I don't know if you... um, I don't, so I don't know if you disagree if I'm using that definition of narrative. I would say that the Twitter files absolutely pushed a incredibly malevolent narrative relating to Twitter. Um, so for the Hunter Biden ones, uh, the, so Schellenberger, I'm just quoting from 45 and 46, in the end, the FBI's influence campaign aimed at executives at news media, Twitter, and other social media companies worked. They censored and discredited the Hunter Biden laptop story. By December of 2020, Baker and his colleagues even sent a note of thanks to the FBI for its work. So note that it's, it's never been proven in any of these files that any specific request was made about the Hunter Biden laptop, but that's like selling a pretty clear picture that like the IC is trying to come down on Twitter to censor the story, and they managed to do it. And then in the next tweet, it follows up by literally saying that they the FBI's influence campaign may have been helped by the fact that it was paying Twitter millions of dollars for its staff time. Uh, I, f- I feel like that's selling a pretty a pretty malicious narrative of Twitter. Like, I think most people would walk away from that and go, wow, the IC is paying a lot of money to Twitter to censor stories about Democrats that they don't want to get out. I, I think that's fair. Uh, I think that, so first of all, I think that the FBI absolutely did have an agenda that they were pushing. I think there's plenty of evidence of that. And, there's, you know, they... The, in the Twitter files, Twitter executives are referring to these meetings that they're having with with the FBI. We had tons of emails with lists of Twitter violators, et cetera. We know that um, that that uh, the FBI met with both Facebook, Meta, and Twitter um, uh, to discuss this incoming um, Russian uh, hoax psyop operation that was that was uh, uh, supposedly right right on the brink of being dropped, and then. You know, the next week came the Hunter Biden laptop story. So, yes, I think it's it, there's a clear picture that the FBI was malevolent. So before I was saying talking about the complexity within Twitter, I don't think that Twitter is really the villain here. I think that Twitter, it's a more complicated picture. You have to focus on who at Twitter was saying what with the, uh, in the in the case of the Hunter Biden laptop and the FBI. I think the, the picture that we paint accurately from the evidence is that the FBI um, knew that the Hunter Biden laptop story was coming. We know that. We know that the FBI knew that this New York Post story was coming um, because they had they were spying on Giuliani. They had the, the, the laptop in their possession. Uh, they knew what was on it, and they knew the story was coming. And then right before the story dropped, they went to Meta. They went to Twitter. Um, they probably went to other platforms as well and said, we have reason to believe that there is a um, Russian disinformation campaign that's about to drop. Um, and uh, and and it, there's also some indication that they mentioned Hunter Biden. Um, so then the story drops. Um, then shortly after the story drops, um, they they uh, there's this um, that oh, famous open letter with like 51 in- IC members signed onto it, saying that this is all the earmarks of a Russian disinformation campaign. And we know now that there was no such Russian disinformation campaign, and the Hunter Biden laptop is real, and everything in the New York Post story was accurate. And and specific links 
related to the Hunter Biden laptop were requested to be taken down. Well, yeah, yeah. pictures of Hunter Biden were taken down. Well, pi- yeah, but those were pictures of Hunter Biden's Johnson. <laughs> Right. There were requests made for stuff to be removed from Twitter. But I, I for every Internet archive, for a link that I tried to find for what was taken down, it, all of it was. Um, well, the New, the New York Post sto- uh, account was suspended. And for sure, 24 well, that's hours, a, careful, that's a share a link to the story. That's a different claim, though. Right. If we're talking about the censorship of the New York Post story, that's one claim. But on the other side, people and a lot of these end up getting mixed together. And I can't tell if we're doing some CEO yeah, yeah. alchemy here. But like the, the for the requests that the White House was making to get specific specific links taken down, those were pictures of, those were like explicit images of Hunter Biden. Those are the only things that I ever saw. And I'm almost positive that those were actually only because I think if they would have made a request to take down a tweet that just contained, contained some type of information or something, Schellenberger would have been reporting on that instead of just this kind of amorphous statement of some links were requested to be taken down. Every link that I was able to follow um, through an internet archive link was an explicit picture of Hunter Biden's dick usually. Um, so, um, uh, well, and then also I'm, wait, can I just, I, I, I'm writing down notes as you're talking because, and if you want to go back and forth we can i actually prefer that but i just want to make sure i'm getting all the stuff when we say this thing like the fbi was pushing an agenda i understand that narrative okay the fbi they're watching giuliani they know he's got the laptop and they're talking to twitter and they're like hold on twitter we need to stop you guys from there's russian disinformation we're trying to sell this idea that the fbi knows that story's coming they're trying to get ahead of it but if we like take a step <clears throat> back 2016 was a nightmare for social media um I believe Zuckerberg and Dorsey, I think, were both complaining a lot that we have no idea what to look out for when it comes to this type of like foreign interference. And we're having no input from the intelligence communities about how we're supposed to do any of this. We just, we, there's no communication here. And going forward from 2016, especially after the Mueller investigation, especially after the indictments came out, especially when you're getting these accounts like that uh, Tennessee GOP account on Twitter, that being a Russian account, um, there, was a, there was way more communication between the intelligence community and Twitter. Can it be the case that they're legitimately trying to just make sure that there's not really weird stuff popping up on social media that's being spearheaded from Russia, that's being spearheaded from foreign enemies? Like, I feel like that, if we go with that narrative, the one that I'm trying to sell, I feel like that explains every single action pretty well. I don't have to find any more like weird things to explain that corroboration. The intelligence community thinks there's weird stuff coming. They give Twitter a heads up. They don't force them to remove anything. They don't make explicit demands for anything. You said something before that there's indications that they mentioned Hunter Biden. I have never seen that corroborated source anywhere ever in my life. I know that it ends up in tweets. I think Schellenberger even kind of alludes to it, but I have never, ever seen that produced, that that there was an email or anything with a direct mention of Hunter Biden ever. Um, The closest thing I saw to it was that there might be disinformation related to politicians and their family members, I think was the closest thing, but never a direct thing to um, Hunter Biden. Um, And I just, yeah, and I don't agree with that statement that like when we're talking about the FBI meeting with Twitter and Meta to discuss Russian psyops, that that's a clear picture that the FBI was acting with malevolence. I think that's kind of what we would expect our intelligence agencies to do. Like we want them to be okay. collaborating with other people to make sure that there's not like forward information that's being like spread across all of our social media campaigns or, or all of our social media platforms. That is not the process that the FBI nor other intelligence communicate uh, members of the intelligence community are supposed to go through when communicating with social media companies. There's you know there's subpoenas, there's court orders, there's there's a typical and traditional process that has been going on. With the Twitter files, we see literal huge CSV files, just like, okay, hey, casual email, can you go through all these accounts and, and you know, in all these tweets and take them down? Like, that is unprecedented. That is not how a relationship between social media companies and the government is supposed to be happening. Yeah, I mean, like, when you say there's, th- that's not the process, this is a new process, but every year, uh, it's every year something new is happening, right? No like, one knew the, about this process, but no one, no one was told about this process. There's, there was entire portals created, and, and David can uh, possibly speak to this with regard to COVID, um, where you know a, a full app was essentially created for the government to do takedown requests. Um, there, but when we say nobody knew about this process. Um, I don't know if we know every single thing that all the intelligence communities are doing, but like, for instance, I know that a lot of people got really mad about the three and a half million dollars that are being paid out from the IC to Twitter, um, for the FBI specifically to Twitter in order to do these investigations. But I'm pretty sure, you, I think you can Google literally on public pages, like there are ways to pay companies for doing work at the behest of the government. Like if the government says like, hey, um, we're curious about these accounts, can you look into this? And like, obviously we're gonna compensate for your time. All of this is public knowledge. Um, there's, yeah. Also, you mentioned this too, and again, 
a lot of this stuff gets kind of all washed together. When you say there were huge CSV files where they said to go through these accounts, the thing that I remember reading was, um, I think that the FBI had flagged like some 200,000 accounts, I think, on a file that they'd sent to Twitter and asked them to go through. None of those accounts were banned. Uh, it's not like Twitter went through and was like, thank you, FBI, we're gonna ban this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And I think that when you look at the emails that were leaked, again, it was a lot of legitimate internal conversation over like, okay, they've given us this. Like, how do we wanna deal with this? Like, do we agree with that? And the FBI made a lot of requests sometimes that I don't think it didn't really go through. It's not like, like the FBI was like, you know, check these accounts out and Twitter was like, okay, we did. We don't think there's anything wrong with them. And then they moved on from it. I think, I think we need to define pressure because it seems like the, you know, you, you have a different definition. Sure. Do we, do you feel like pressure was being, um, put on to Twitter? And I guess if you say pressure, like pressure, how, or where do you see that at? Yeah. I mean, on the same day that Biden came out, and this was on July 16th, came out and said that social media companies were killing people by failing to censor COVID misinformation. That was the same day that Berenson got suspended from Twitter. And then the next month he was completely banned. And for anyone who doesn't know about the Berenson case, you know, they can go check it, check it out. But like the, the public, you know, administration narrative was very much like putting this public pressure on social media companies to do something about this. You're killing people. And then behind the scenes, they're making these massive requests. So I, I'd like to get David uh, to, to hop in. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, my, in my reporting, I um, mine wasn't really connected with the FBI, but rather the White House um, in both administrations, um, first in Trump, but then much more so in the Biden administration where um, one of the top uh, Twitter employees, Lauren Culbertson, um, had written an email where she was recounting the various interactions that they had with, with the White House. And she characterized it as they were, quote, very angry that Twitter was not complying with their wishes, um, that they didn't deplatform a number of people. Um, so, you know, that, I mean, it, it's, I know there are a few cases sort of winding through the legal system right now. And there, I know there's some legal arguments that are being made that, you know, I, I don't know the exact terminology, but this is essentially what they are arguing is that this is an infringement on the First Amendment by proxy, that you that although the the White House isn't, you know, directly um, preventing someone from speaking by putting their boot on the neck of a social media platform that has, you know, many billions of dollars in business at stake that are they are regulated by the federal government when the government, you know, asks, quote, asks you or tells you to do something there, there's really not a difference between the two, um, yeah. ultimately. But so that, I feel like you're uh, I don't know if knows what you're saying. I feel like, I feel like what you're that you're concerned about or that you're speaking to, but yeah, I feel I feel like what you're saying though kind of proves my point. So when you're saying like the White House is very angry that they weren't complying, mm -hmm. then then what do they do? I mean, it's not like well, but so okay, mm -hmm. no, that's a good point. You're saying look, that, well, so a couple things. It's a good point you make. So what is the boot on the neck? Is what I'm looking for. Like, right. So yeah. let, me, let me let me explain to you uh, my perspective on this, mm -hmm. which is that you're right, and and what I noted in my reporting was that. There were many instances where um, where the Twitter staff pushed back and did not. You know, we could see lots of instances where Twitter, where they were um, having lots of um, heated conversations internally, trying to decide, you know, what they should do on particular tweets or on particular accounts. So it's not that this wasn't like a, you know, this is not how the real world works, where there are at least not as in this instance, where there's like a phone call is made and boom, everything happens. Rather, what you could see is is the overall pattern, which I tried to paint um, in, my, in my reporting, where I gave a series of instances where you saw legitimate information being suppressed in, in a variety of ways. And then in addition, where you saw that the Twitter sort of policy was to follow what um, what the CDC recommended. And if you veered from the CDC, which is the government, if you veered from that, then it was, quote, misinformation. Yeah, and I understand what you're saying here. Their oh, tendency was to lean toward, and I forget the exact language that was used, but their tendency was to lean toward anything that would potentially increase transmission, in their view, that that's what that's where they leaned mm -hmm. now that that's their prerogative but i think it's certainly reasonable to to connect the dots when you have 
the White House telling you they're angry about something. And as Bill had pointed out, the sort of um, uh, uh, timing with where they, you know, Biden came out this public claim about social media killing people. And then like the next moment, Berenson's off the platform. It's, I mean, the, the, to me, the, I mean, we, you can't prove, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, no one can prove something. But what we do know is that the White House put pressure on Twitter to act in certain ways and that from a legal and ethical standpoint, it, it can be argued that that was an attempt to infringe on people's right to speech. Um, that, that's a, sure. that, that to me is the case that I can make. And people can argue mm -hmm. about how much or to what degree Twitter quote unquote caved to these requests or demands. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know. Um, but what we do know is the evidence that they were pushing on them. Yes, yeah, so, okay, so they, here's, just real quick on response though. So I want to be super ultra clear. Um, I don't expect you guys to know anything about me. Okay, I'm a huge fan of freedom of speech. I think that a lot of the censorship on the internet has gone way too far. Um, and I think we should be having a lot of these conversations relating to COVID and mRNA, rerunning your DNA and all the things that I think are crazy. I still think they should be platformed and I think we should have conversations about them. I think that's totally fine. So I agree with you that Twitter probably went too far in terms of some of the censorship. Um, or absolutely went too far in terms of some of the censorship. So um, don't ever confuse that I'm, don't, don't confuse any of my points. I'm trying to say that Twitter was, um, that Twitter should be censoring things, um, not legally or whatever, but just morally. I don't think they should be. But um, so let me, let me get out of the way immediately, okay? Now that understood that and then put that aside. I think that it's important that just because two people might have a semi congruent position doesn't necessarily mean there was a ton of pressure from here to there. So for instance, like when you say things like, isn't it convenient that Twitter seemed to hold a lot of similar positions as the CDC when it came to vaccine information? Well, that's not that surprising at all, especially knowing, um, and I'm sure you guys probably know better than I do, the types of people that work at Twitter, right? A lot of San Francisco yuppies, a lot of people that are probably ideologically a bit further left, maybe even in the mainstream. Um, and I think, David, even in your tweets, you were pointing that there were probably a lot of, um, I think it was tweet 17 where you spoke about, um, as with people institutions, there's individual and collective bias, right? When you were pointing out the issues with Twitter's process, um, I agree that there's good stuff to tackle into there. Um, you pointed out that doing moderation with bots on really complex complicated issues is really challenging. I know this because I've been dinged several times by YouTube as spreading misinformation, even though I parrot the CDC almost exactly just because I set off the, the wrong alarm. Um, and then you bring up that like outsourcing information to foreign contractors that might not even be completely English fluent might be bad. And then third, you mentioned that like inputs from people at higher levels of management might lead to some form of bias. I agree with all of those things. And I think every single one of those is a really good place to start uh, a, a, an internal review of like, maybe our process isn't good enough. But to circle back, we, you keep using these words like the White House pressured, um, the, there was the boot on the neck. I just don't see that ever. I've never seen in any, in any of the Twitter files, and I haven't seen all of them, so maybe I've missed one, but I've never seen anywhere where a whole bunch of internal discussion was happening and people were like, listen guys, we gotta do this or the White House is, it's over for us. We're gonna get uh, you know, regulated out of existence. We're gonna, you know, Biden is saying that the, the White House, the CDC is gonna ax our site, that Fauci's you know, got an ax and he's at the front doors. I've just never seen that type of pressure ever, other than just saying like the White House was upset at something, which to be fair, I imagine every White House is probably upset at every social media at some point in time. I mean, the Trump House, Trump White House is making a lot of requests for Twitter to remove stuff too. Um, sometimes there's a lot more vanity behind it. So uh, I, I feel like that's kind of expected uh, that there's gonna be some adversary relationship there. I just don't think it's like the worst thing in the world. And I don't think it's evidence of any wrongdoing. I mean, I'll, I'll just throw in one, one, one thing with, um with Andy Slavitt at the White House and Berenson, I mean, there's the leaked Slack screenshot asking directly, why hasn't Berenson been kicked off the platform yet? I mean, that that's like, there there is direct, there are direct communications that have come out from the White House. And, you know, I mean, and as I said, I mean, I, you saw in my thread, I, I had a screenshot of, of the email from Lauren Culbertson where she described, you know, several of these meetings. It wasn't like, one meeting. This was a repeated thing that the executive branch did with with a number of social media platforms. I mean, in my experience and how a lot of things function, you know, whether in politics or in, in business or other institutions, most things don't they there there need not always be an email exchange between executives at Twitter saying, hey, did, you know, it's it's not like a like a second rate movie where they need this expository, you know, scene. Um, Bottom line, the White House was contacting Twitter, among other uh, social media platforms, and making their 
wishes very, very clear to them about what they wanted to happen. How much or to what degree Twitter then capitulated to those demands, we don't know. But if we're discussing whether it's appropriate or not, in my view, I don't see how it's ever appropriate for the White House to be telling a social media platform what content is or is not misinformation. That's what other people can disagree, but to me, I don't think that that's the best system where the government is the decider of misinformation. David, can you quickly, can you quickly speak to how this isn't necessarily as partisan as many think as well? Because there were some requests coming in from Trump administration as well. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I started off my, my reporting where I mentioned how the Trump administration had some requests related to, um, I think it was like, um, I forget the term, but uh, um, like panic buying and stuff like that. And they wanted misinformation taken down related to that. So um, that was the one nugget I found from t Trump. I know there's been other reporting from, so yeah, I mean, look, I, just not that I should have to announce this. I'm not a, a right-wing individual or Republican. I approached all of this apolitically. I, f from my standpoint, I just want from, being involved in COVID reporting for the last three years now, I observed a lot of things happening where tweets were, were labeled as misleading, where accounts were suspended for things that I knew were true, um, things that were from, from studies in, in you know, peer reviewed journals, or maybe we shouldn't say true, but things that were certainly legitimate information from mm -hmm. accepted um, sources like a peer reviewed journal. And they were nevertheless taken down because in some manner or another, they went against kind of the CDC's guidance or a mainstream narrative. So when I had the opportunity to then, you know, look behind the curtain and try to figure out, well, what actually happened? Um, that's what I tried to do. And, and I think it was a combination, in my view, it was a combination of pressure from the White House, but also the internal politics and dynamics of Twitter and the other social media companies and the people who work there and what they felt was the right thing to do. I don't think this was like a malicious thing necessarily. Um, you know, they were trying to do the right thing um, in their in their minds and some and in some instances, which I reported on, I think they made the wrong call. Um, and, you know, those instances are part of a larger system. Sometimes it was, you know, specific things. But what I tried to do is paint a picture of like, well, here are these sort of systems um, at work in play where you had bots that were set up and, you know, to, and but ultimately it comes back to people who decided how the bots and the, you know, machine learning would function. What are the inputs? So um, I don't know if that satisfies your thing or maybe you're focusing on a, on a slightly different um, angle that's of importance to you, but that's that's kind of how I view the story and what I wanted to, to bring to light. I thought it was important for people to see, one, that the White House did interact with Twitter and make very strong demands or requests on the company, mm -hmm. and two, that there are a variety of instances and a variety of ways through which Twitter um, censored information inappropriately. And I don't know the solution to that for moving forward or for next time, but in my view, that's something we should try as a society to remedy in, sure. some, in some manner. So I, I think an, I'll, I'll step clear. back maybe late and can jump yeah, in. Go for it. Yeah, go yeah, I, <laughs> I think we should be clear about what we are and what we are not arguing. So first of all, um, in terms of the FBI's requests, um, there are emails from within Twitter about how voluminous these requests are, that they were like, the, I mean, the FBI was sending them lists of Twitter violators of people who had like 19 followers and zero retweets uh, to the to the extent that like Twitter executives are saying among themselves, like Jim Baker actually said an email, Jim Baker, who's former chief counsel for the FBI was like, it's weird that they're spending all this time like act actively looking for people who are violating Twitter terms of service and sending them to us. So yeah, they paid $3 million to Twitter for, for in compensation for the time that Twitter's employees were spent spending going through the list of, S of FBI Twitter violators, TOS violators. But what that indicates is just how much time, like you can say that's totally fair, like, you know, just like when you do a FOIA request and you can you have to compensate the government for the, for the staff time. Yeah, but $3 million of time of like Twitter employees time going through these viol these these alleged violations every day. So there's a sheer volume question that the FBI regular had meetings with Twitter executives. You're right that when you look at these, the, 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 um, the, 
these actual discussion threads on Slack and by email, there are many, many, many instances in which Twitter um, uh, disagrees with the FBI and does not ban these things. It's, it happens over and over and over again. I don't think anybody who was reporting on the Twitter files was trying to present a picture where, like, every time the FBI said jump, Twitter said how, said how high. For me, like Twitter, I think a lot of employees there, even though I disagree with a whole lot of their decisions, I think a lot of these folks were acting in good faith um, in the, not all of them, not Jim Baker, but like, but a lot of these folks, I think, were acting in good faith, trying to make the, the, these decisions as best they can, um, given limited information and time pressure, et cetera. To me, the, 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 the bigger picture is that you have this privatized space where people are exercising civic discourse, like a, a, a place that should be in a democracy, a free speech space. But because it's privatized, you have an opportunity sort of like the, the government can't go and censor people for speaking their mind because of the First Amendment. But they can just like anybody else, like anybody can lodge a complaint to Twitter and say you should take, you know, re flag and report TOS violations. The FBI was taking was took advantage of that um, that sort of uh, prerogative they had to assign agents to spend all day just looking for these these these, these violators and sending them to Twitter, overwhelming Twitter with just tons and tons of requests. Um, and there was a, and Twitter was had every right to say no, and in many cases did say say no, and in some cases said yes, and in some of those cases I think were totally inappropriate. But the point is like. They, 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 it was an avenue for the government to just constantly lean on on this the, the, this private company again and again and again to essentially remove communications which were politically inconvenient to the administration, and that's a problem for any but for any American. I think it's just the the issue. The greater issue is the sort of privatization of public space. So if you're looking for like, um, if you expect the Twitter files to reveal like pure like manichaean bad guys you know just arch villains um and who you can name and and and, and uh, put a face on no you're not going to find that in the twitter files because it's more complex um it's more human it's more bureaucratic than that but the bigger picture that it paints i think is pretty should be disturbing to anybody who cares about free speech so i i just i feel like the conversation is so um there, there are really good questions in here and i feel like we just hand wave those and just assume no so some, there, I think David posed this question. Should the government be making requests to social media platforms? That's a really good question. That's a really challenging question to ask. I think it's a bit naive to say the government should have no input whatsoever uh, on any social media platforms, especially after the shit show that was 2016, especially post uh, 2019 with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Um, I think that forget the government and forget the social media platforms. I think a lot of US citizens genuinely have questions and worry about what exists on some of the social media platforms. I think there's a lot of US citizens that don't want foreign actors properly up fake accounts on Instagram or Twitter. I think that's an interest that the American people have. And if there's some level of coordination that the United States intelligence communities can have with social media, I think it's worth exploring that. I think there's legitimate arguments that, get, that can be made that that relationship is probably a positive one. Um, now, I agree that it could be abused, and I agree that it could be inappropriate. I just never saw any of that. That's what I'm. That's kind of what I'm looking for because. Based on, so here's something that I would bet my whole life on. If I were to ask people that say that they followed like the Twitter files, just if I asked them, do you know, are you familiar with the Twitter files? If I were to ask people about this, probably 80% of them would say like, oh yeah, um, I think the White House was paying, face, uh, was paying Twitter to censor conservatives. Uh, that's like the general trend that people walk away from from the Twitter files, and I think it's I think it's fair to have that impression if you're just reading the text of the tweets and not going into the actual. Uh, emails and stuff that are being leaked because that's always what's being sold. That's like the overall narrative that's being sold is that these improper requests are being made by the FBI to take down stuff that is conservative, to take down stuff that the, CD, the, the CDC disagrees with, which heavily is leans conservative online. And I just, I don't think that any of that was ever supported. Um, even the way that you load some of these things, like you're saying like overwhelming Twitter with requests. Were they really being overwhelmed with requests? Like uh, Twitter got yes. $3.5 million in compensation. That, that company generated like billions of dollars over Five billion dollars of revenue in 2021. Um, was this like really too much labor for them to deal no, with? No, no, no. It's not about the, it's not about the amount of money that they spend. It's about the amount of labor time that was put into this. Like, it, 
yes, I can say that they're overwhelmed with requests because they said so repeatedly in the emails. Like Twitter executives were complaining about how often about this volume of requests coming from the FBI. This isn't me talking. This is executives at Twitter sure. complaining about how zealous the FBI was. Okay, but let's say they complain about that, okay? Nobody's forcing you to adhere to any of those requests. If you're not getting a subpoena, it's just the FBI making requests. You're, uh, my perspective on it, which it seems like you disagree with, is when... And, and I don't necessarily disagree with you if there is actual, you know, uh, uh, foreign powers, you know, a actually putting in sort of bot farms or whatever to influence the discourse. I I'm not necessarily opposed to the intelligence community then sharing that information with social media platforms. Look, here's what we found. Here's the evidence. You know, we, we think you should do something about this. It's infesting your, your platform. Um, although with, with Matt Taibbi's recent reporting, some of you know with the Hamilton 68 um apparently some of the stuff that was deemed sort of Russian bot farms and misinformation wasn't so but I'm not saying that's not you know I understand that was from the think tank but um but putting that aside so I don't necessarily disagree if they had evidence of it but that's not what I found in my reporting regarding um the suppression of certain types of content and I think there's a, a, a pretty wide chasm between an intelligence community saying we have really um, concrete evidence that Russia or some other entity is putting in these sort of misinformation bot farms within within your platform. Here's the evidence we think you know you, you probably want to take a look at this to take it down. There's a wide chasm between that and the government naming specific individuals, you know, many of whom are U.S. citizens, and naming very specific types of content that they want to taken down. Um, because so uh, to me, those are two very different things. So you're raising one issue that seems legitimate and the other one, in my view, I think was inappropriate. Which, so which part, what was inappropriate? Which request? I'm curious, what type of request do you think was inappropriate? Um, I think it's inappropriate for them to get angry at the platform at, at Twitter for not deplatforming a number of individuals that the government, I don't think that that's the white house's, um, I don't think that that's their their. They can't get that way. It's inappropriate for them to get angry. Isn't that kind of like, really? Well, it's inappropriate for yes. When you are when when you're the the executive branch, and this is you know, and you're making requests to a company on on how they should conduct their business. Obviously, those are more than just a request that, or or it certainly can be interpreted as such. I I, f I, I need something more for because this is a line that is floated by. But that's so many just times. a fundamental thing. You don't need. Proof, that is how the world functions. But, the, but I can has show you power over you and makes a request. I mean, this is the what sort is of the fundamental power, thing about what's that? So Biden what? ran on Section 230 repeal. He said that he was in favor of it. So like, Trump wanted to run. Trump wanted to, but Trump wanted to remove Section well, 230. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are we arguing about Trump versus Biden? Who no, cares? I'm saying like, that. I'm fine. saying Trump, that. Trump did too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the saying that federal government has power over Twitter. <clears throat> sure. First of all, there, section but Section 230 repeal would not be the executive branch. That would be from Congress, right? Fine. So so but, so so, so that's already a separate government. thing. But also but also we have evidence, and so this is kind of the thing that I'm looking for. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, what is the pressure? Okay, if the FBI requested a whole bunch of stuff, and we all know there was that list, I keep repeating this, there, there were like 200,000 accounts, that huge file that they wanted removed. Twitter did nothing about it, and nothing happened. It's not like the White House was like, okay, well, now we're coming after you guys. We're pulling all our business, or we're sending FBI people to go rustle up your employees. The office, like, what was the consequences for them continually not following through on some of the requests that the the FBI or the White House was making? Can I can I ask you a question? Yeah, go for you, it. Destiny, um, uh, do you believe that there is, was a major nefarious foreign threat of of like you know bot farms that were going to disrupt U.S. elections? And Absolutely, that were, yeah, uh, of course. Se seeding, yeah, really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think maybe that's a. Di well, wait, do you did, do you did you not believe any of the Mueller indictments? That the Internet Research Agency the, was a real thing, that that 10 GOP account, that there were accounts on Instagram that were just like basically like black people would come up and say like, I don't think Hillary supports BLM. And those specific oh, no, no, accounts no. were tied to Russian investment. Like, do you that not believe happened. that? Yeah. The, no, no. The Kremlin spent several hundred thousand dollars on Facebook ads. Sure. Um, I believe that that happened. Do I think it's significant? Absolutely wait, hold not. Hold on. No, no, no. no wait, that's not true. It wasn't just Facebook ads. That's not true. They had stooge accounts that at. 10 GOP account that yes. had over like 200,000 followers. It was, so it wasn't just Facebook ads, and it was a false company that was set up in the as, United States, right? As did the Department of Defense, by the way, per Lee Fong's reporting, had dummy accounts 
on Twitter right. that were pushing U.S. foreign policy propaganda, including support for the war in Yemen, and Twitter just allowed those accounts to continue, and even they, though they have a well, policy. First of all, wait, wait, that, well, wait, 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 wait. Firstly, that was a big whataboutism. Secondly, do you think I would defend that if that is true? Obviously, I would be opposed to that as well. Like, I would say we shouldn't do that either. But if you're going to tell me that, okay. yeah. So, yeah, yeah so, so I, I want to support so that. That was me, as well. Me, but I don't know if me, I don't know if Twitter knew that. Yeah, go for it. Let me finish my thought. Okay, so 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 yes, I do. Do do I believe that there's a such thing as the Internet Research Agency and that they have these troll farms and stuff? Yes, absolutely. But it's a question of scale. Sure. Is it commensurate to the to the to the threat that has been attached to it? I think of what is a much bigger threat is the boogeyman effect of what I think is a uh, pretty insignificant uh, influence operation on U.S. elections. Um, and I think that the upshot of the Mueller report was that, in fact, it didn't have much consequence whatsoever. Um, but as per uh, what uh, David mentioned about Saibi's latest thread on Hamilton 68, you know, it was constantly used as this way to threat inflate um, stuff that was purely domestic, the like uh, uh, political actors who were who were exercising legitimate constitutionally protected free speech, who were accused of being uh, Russian trolls, um, and that was loud and clear with the Hamilton 68 stuff, and it happened, and it was loud and clear with the Hunter Biden laptop stuff. So yes, uh, so so the question is. Uh, were there was there were there Russian disinformation operations? Sure, absolutely. You could, but what about the um, the the uh, the sort of the, the the converse of that, which is people, domestic actors, using this 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 supposed threat of Russian disinformation to discredit legitimate speech by Americans? That we showed that in the Twitter files over and over and over again. Yeah. So. I'm not going to disagree with you. Uh, okay. I think that the boogeyman effect, well, with parts of that, I think the boogeyman effect is real. And I think that we probably do more damage to domestic discourse when we're labeling everybody as a, race, a racist, a fascist, a communist, uh, whatever like thing. We're doing more damage to our own discourse there in trying to like see boogeyman everywhere than just actually confronting like, okay, well, legitimately, there are some Americans that believe this thing or that thing. Let's talk about it, right? I, I'm not going to disagree with you. I agree with you 100%. But I, I guess what I don't like is that the framing is always so malicious from the intelligence communities when I think, and based on hundreds of people I've spoken to that work in intelligence communities, based on everything I've ever seen published as such, it seems like for the most part, people that work in these communities are just average good Americans, they're trying to do what they can to make sure they're doing the right thing. It's not like they're coming at these social medias where like, we're going to censor this and take out political operatives. You said that thing that people were looking at political actors accused of being Russian trolls, but earlier, I think you accurately surmised, what it actually was is that like the FBI would put together a list of, of like all these accounts they've got like 12 followers they all follow like six accounts and they've tweeted like some message and they're like these look like bots now i could be wrong and you guys could tell me i don't believe there were ever like it wasn't like the fbi was saying like, you need to ban all these republican senators you need to ban these high profile accounts to get rid of them because they're disseminating speech that we disagree with and 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 again to go back again even when the fbi was making these requests sometimes really large ones sometimes twitter just didn't follow it and it didn't seem like there were any repercussions that followed well okay so twitter Kicked, uh, suspended the New York Post's Twitter account, and were, and for 24 hours you yep. could not even you couldn't post or DM the uh, the New York Post story three weeks before the election um, about Hunter about Hunter Biden. That was that was a uh, the reason why they took that action is because the FBI pre-bunked the story by meeting with these social media platforms and saying there is a we have reason to believe that there's going to be a Russian disinformation drop come dump coming. Um, and then, lo and behold, all of a sudden, the Hunter Biden laptop story comes. So, like, um, and the FBI, we have reason to, unless one, the right hand wasn't talking to the left hand, the FBI as an institution knew that the story was legitimate. They had possession of the laptop. They knew that the provenance was real, that it was not Russian disinformation. And yet they went and talked to these the, these uh, social media platforms and uh, and warned them of this mysterious dis Russian disinformation drop. Do you find anything shady or unseemly about that chain um, of events? It's a compelling story, but I would have to ask, if the FBI was trying to censor it, there are so many other things they could have done. By your own reporting, or not, I'm not sorry, by the reporting that's been done, the um, FBI knew, we all agree with this, right? The FBI knew that that Hunter Biden laptop had been sent to them and had been sent to Giuliani, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the FBI was truly trying to censor that story and truly trying to sway the election, um, 
why wouldn't they have just taken it from Giuliani? Why wouldn't they have just gone to the New York Post and like gotten that drive completely and told them like, you're not publishing any of this, we're locking you up because it's a threat to national security. Because if they really wanted to get it not published, they could have just done that. Instead of literally Streisand affecting that story to be one of like the largest stories in the past five years. And we all well, knew they, that would happen, right? You're wondering why they didn't say, say that again? Why they I'm, didn't I'm asking if you that. think that, because it feels like you're saying that Twitter censored this story because of the FBI essentially, right? That on their own, Twitter would have never censored that story, but it was because the FBI primed them to think there was an illegitimate leak coming and everything happened just as the FBI wanted it to. Well, that was the case. Why didn't the FBI just go after Giuliani or go after the New York Post and say, you guys aren't publishing this. We're subpoenaing you. We're taking on the materials. And now it's under investigation. You can't talk well, about they it. Did subpoena the, they did subpoena the drive. They had possession of the drive. They had taken it from, from that Joel Mac Isaac guy in Delaware. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Can't tell he gave them that drive after making an image of it, I thought. Didn't he, he contacted right. the FBI and he, he so they didn't he, steal he, it from he him. Them, they didn't do anything about it. They just said, they know he notified them. They didn't mm -hmm. do anything about it. And then they came back later once, after he had sent it to Giuliani and mm -hmm. took the drive. Sure. So they had possession of the drive. Mm -hmm. Obviously they can't tell the New York Post not to, to not to run the story. That wait, why not? Because the, the FBI can't order a, a, an outlet not to publish a story. But the FBI can order Twitter to censor the story? No, no, no. They didn't order Twitter to do anything. They came, they represented what was coming down the pipeline as Russian disinformation. Um, then at that point, first of all, um, there was a discussion within Twitter. Y'all Roth um, found there to be no violations um, uh, based on what was in the New York Post story. Um, he was then overruled by Jim Baker, who is a former FBI lawyer. Um, who said? Who said? No, I, I. We have reason to believe that this is Russian disinformation. And then Yal Ruff later on changed his mind and decided to go forward with censoring the Hunter Biden laptop story. So no, the FBI didn't tell Twitter to censor the story. They can't do that. But what they can do is uh, give Twitter Twitter um, dishonestly every reason to believe that this story was Russian disinformation. So that on their own initiative, by the way, with the chief counsel being former FBI and a whole so many more FBI people, former FBI people in the Twitter top ranks that they had their own Slack group called Bue Alumni. For, they had a, a PDF for onboarding new uh, intelligence community uh, uh, employees onto Twitter. So they, it was just populated with former FBI folks. Um, so, so with that influence within Twitter, they were able to then overrule Yal Roth's decision and censor the Hunter Biden laptop story, much to Yol Roth's later regret. Sure. To be clear, if we're going to cite Yol Roth, it's important that he has said on multiple occasions that there was, and I think you guys aren't making this, but just to reiterate, there was never a specific ask by the FBI or ever a specific mention of Hunter Biden ever by the FBI. Yol Roth himself has said that on at least three separate occasions, um, which I don't think you're making that exact claim because you're saying they're being a little bit more amorphous about it or a little bit more nebulous about it. I just, here's what I don't understand. Twitter is a mess. I, I think Zuckerberg was the one who mentioned that Hunter Biden may have been brought up in the meeting with him, with FBI. Sure, Zuckerberg might have said it, but for Twitter, there was never a specific mention of Hunter Biden. Um, it, I just, here's what I'm not understanding. So I think we're agreeing on some things that the FBI couldn't directly make a request, couldn't directly censor a story, but they could apply a lot of pressure. Twitter is a huge company. I feel like if somebody were to ask me, you've got to pressure somebody to not publish something, I would have a way easier time pressuring the New York Post than Twitter. Like, I, I don't know why all the same strategies they're using at Twitter, because they knew that, you, because we, we remember, an important part of your story is that the FBI must be acting malevolently because they knew that Giuliani had this story and they knew that it was being sent to the New York Post. They knew these things and that's why they got ahead of it by going to Twitter. Well, if they knew all of that and they were trying to get ahead of it, why? here's what I don't understand. Why wouldn't the FBI go to the New York Post and say, listen, you possess something that we have very strong information about is probably Russian disinformation. And if you publish that, you guys are gonna be in big trouble. There's gonna be a huge investigation you guys might get shut down. This might be Cambridge Analytical for the New York Post. You guys are way small on the Facebook. You won't survive. I don't know why the FBI wouldn't have tried that same type of pressure. The New York, I mean, first of all, we don't know that they didn't. We, that, we all, absolutely York, know that the New York Post would have talked about it, right? Obviously. Okay, right? fine, fine. Granted, it's, it's unlikely that they did, but the New York Post knew it wasn't disinform Russian disinformation. They had done the reporting. They had the laptop. Twitter didn't have the laptop. They had to take the FBI's word for it. Well, I, I don't know how you think that the New York Post then could have known it was legitimate. Because it was dropped off by Hunter Biden at the, the, he had a signed receipt from Hunter Biden at the laptop repair shop. The FBI had subpoenaed it. They had possession of the like the the story that that John Mac Isaac told is backed up by documentary evidence. 
Hold on. Had My under, that's I don't think that's... Story. I could be wrong. It's been a long time. I don't think they had the laptop. My understanding is that there was an image of the disk. So you can t mount an ISO and you can take a picture, basically, a virtual picture of the hard drive, and that that image was sent to Giuliani, and then Giuliani shopped around with that image. And to say that the New York Post knew that it was legitimate, I, my understanding is that even Fox News didn't want to run this story, and it would have been sensational for them to. So I don't think it was very obvious that it was super, like, that was a 100% legitimate FBI story. The FBI had the laptop. Yeah, the but FBI yeah, the FBI had the, had the laptop itself. So the only thing that the New York Post got was it was an ISO, it was an image of the drive. They didn't know if it was actually real or not. Like you can have a signature, I got, but they didn't. Have, I don't think they had any of that. But that 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 the actual uh, laptop itself was with the FBI. All they had was a disk image sent by Giuliani. That same image that a lot of other major media didn't want to report on. I'm a little lost in what we're arguing here because I think what you're saying is wh why would they not have gone to the New York Post yeah. to try to censor the story and um, and like. We could talk about that. We could talk about that for the next hour. But the fact of the matter is, in reality, what happened was that whatever the chain of events was, the New York Post was going to run the story. The FBI knew that the story was coming. Um, they had an interest in in uh, in making sure that the story didn't get traction. As you point out, it didn't really work out because of the Streisand effect, but it was discredited. The story was widely still. If you talk to people today, they they they'll tell you that the Hunter Biden laptop is a laptop is a conspiracy theory because there was a stink of conspiracy on it after the after Twitter and Facebook censored the story. So they so I would say that they were quite successful in in uh, in making the Hunter Biden laptop not a campaign issue shortly before the election by forcing by um, not forcing emphatically not forcing by manipulating the social media platforms into censoring that story. And and doing it, in my opinion, dishonestly, because they knew that the story was legitimate. The FBI knew that the story was legitimate. Yeah, I mean, that, that's again, that's a fantastic story. But I don't I just don't think I, I, don't, I don't think that there's anything to evidence any of that. Um, if, Which they, part? If, if <clears throat> the the idea that the FBI was explicitly trying to get Twitter not to post about the or was trying to get them to censor the New York Post story. That they met with them right before the story dropped and said, "We have reason to believe that there's a that there's a big Russian disinformation dump coming." Sure, but they've been what saying this they for been they've to? been saying this for three or four years. There's been a lot what of context since 2016 between the IC and all of these companies going through but, all of but, these accounts and doing all of these things. Like that's been that's right? what they've been doing. They yeah. had in person meetings with Meta and Twitter at like at the same time right before the thing came. They were like, "We need to have a meeting with you." We believe that we're on the brink of seeing a major Russian disinformation dump coming. Lo and behold, like one or two days later, the New York Post story comes. Like, come okay, on. let's say let's say that I let's say that I believe all of this. That, that all you have is like a timing thing here, and you're like, obviously this happened, which is not really the strongest point of evidence. But let's say I give that to you. Why then did they reverse the decision like a day later? Uh, because it turned because it was a mistake, and it was clear that the story was actually real. I, that it's, that's not very compelling to me. I, 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 if it was the case, I'm not sure why it matters. <clears throat> Wait, so like, I, I'm not, I'm not sure why it matters why they reversed it 24 hours later. There, they, it was a big controversy, right? That they that they um, overreached, and so they reversed their decision because they'd overreached. I, I just I don't and understand. Kept, if there was so much pressure from the FBI and they wanted a sense of the story, and they wanted to get rid of it. I, then they, I feel like they would have just banned it and then moved on. But it again, they can't ban it. What do you mean they can't? They How did can ban they, it. How can you're saying the FBI? How no, no, FBI Twitter, Twitter, story? Twitter would have banned it oh. and they would have just kept well, it banned. But it felt like Twitter legitimately felt it. Like, and if we're being honest, OK, now we do know that the story seems to be real. Everything I've heard is, is real. But at the time, it did sound incredibly. Uh, that was a crazy story. Right. It does sound like some fake thing that a blind guy got a MacBook dropped off by Hunter Biden that has a lot of pictures of him, you know, getting foot jobs and smoking crack and also emails with Joe Biden. That's a sensational story. I don't think it's out of pocket. I don't think Wait, it's so crazy so to assume that Twitter, Twitter, Twitter's that, job is to look at printed stories in a newspaper and say, this sounds crazy. It's probably propaganda and censor it. Yeah, that's I think that's what the social media companies have been looking at since 2016 onward. Yes, which that's crazy, dude. You think like the, the that some ex some executive at Facebook or Twitter should be reading The New York Times and say, this story sounds too wild. Let's just censor it. You can say that's crazy. But in 2016, there were protests in the United States that were being organized on both sides by Russian companies set up in the US. 
that's crazy. I'm not going to disagree with you and say that like, um, yeah, we need to censor all of this stuff. It's really bad. I'm just saying that there, you guys seem to be downplaying um, that there was a legitimate fear that foreign actors are acting in incredibly malicious ways to influence our political process. I think that's a real fear. And I think it's legitimate for Americans to have that, especially after what happened in 2016. But now, are, Twitter, are you there? Yeah. Are you arguing because of that threat is real that we should be OK with these social media platforms having the censorship ability? This power to be able to, to to be able to look at a New York Post story and so say this sounds non credible, and then censor it. Do we? Well, let me ask. I guess a flip side question of that. I, I lean towards yes, not. But the flip side is: Do you think that any media publication should be able to publish whatever they want and propagate it on any social media platform they want without repercussion? Any well, that's media a company. But that's a different question. If I could just well, no, jump no, no. In that, it's on second. the other end. It's the same question on the other end because that's what he's advocating. For. Let's say the New York Post says we've got a story that Hunter Biden drinks the blood of nine-year-old children. We know this because we got a source, and now we're going to publish that story. And let's say that it's like this story is like clearly fake. Should they have a right? Are they entitled to use every social media platform to propagate that story? Did you want to respond to that, David? I mean, I mean, if you're picking some like outlandish thing of drinking the blood or whatever you say, I mean. The bottom line is, I, I think the philosophical and and I, uh, ultimately legal question, you know, if, if there is going to be some sort of legislation related to this, you know, to try to remedy some of these things moving forward, is it is and what I and what I showed with some of the COVID reporting, it is totally inappropriate for these social media companies to try to adjudicate the veracity of uh, the information on the platforms most of it in particular something that's published in a in a you know credible um uh, media outlet but even beyond that that the idea you know time and again there were doc you know just shifting from the hunter biden granular details of that just pulling the lens back a little bit there i mean there were doctors who had legitimate information and regular citizens who are who are you know quoting um, statistics from the CDC that nevertheless because they veered against the, the narrative of the CDC and the White House at the time um, and which through pressure or through the own sort of impetus of the the sort of ideological or philosophical leanings of, of the staff at Twitter one way or the other they censored this this information that to me is a very bad recipe for when we these platforms as we know function you know as a utility to some extent it, it is the you know for lack of you know it's a cliche bad analogy of the public square at this point and i am very uncomfortable with the idea of some random people at twitter or let alone um some bot um program that was written let alone people sitting in a um, cube farm somewhere halfway across the world, that they are going to be able to adjudicate the granular details of any story, whether it's, you know, medical, whether it's something related to politics, you know, the Hunter Biden laptop thing. So that's just to me that the, the, the bar needs to be like so high where they are going to, you know, it, obviously anything legal, if, you know, if, if people are inciting violence, or you know things of that nature. No one wants to be on a social media platform where it's just a cesspool of people doxing each other and crazy shit. So it's not that their platforms aren't within not only their right but also what makes sense to have certain you know guardrails within the platform so it's it's a pleasant and and functional place to be. My point is about how they're adjudicating this information. Um, I think is very problematic. I don't I don't know if Leighton wants to. I mean, the, the, the dovetail on that, but. Is that it, they, Twitter lied about it. I mean, specifically with regards to the shadow banning stuff or the visibility filtering. Oh, right. There's that, too. Yeah. So well, uh, for, uh, let me, okay, well, first, real quick. Shadow banning, everybody lies about shadow banning. It's a word game that people play, right? People will say that, no, we don't shadow ban. What we actually do is we make it harder to find your thing in the algorithm. That was, that's. Visibility filter. Yeah, sure. That's not a Twitter. Literally everybody does that. Every that's company a, says they don't but, shadow but ban. That, what does that mean? Everybody does it. It, it doesn't I'm, make it well, acceptable. I'm sorry. not saying that it's acceptable. Well, first of all, it's absolutely acceptable. If a company wants to shadow ban, that's their right to do it, right? We should, we, I, we probably all would approve of that to some extent. If somebody gets on a Twitter uh, and just, they just spam the N word all day and they get shadow banned, we're probably all okay with that, right? Shadow banning is the worst they thing. They should just get banned if they're gonna, if they, if they do that, they can just be transparent and just ban them. Sure, maybe. Shadow banning but, is when you don't even know that it's happening. I want to circle back because my question never got answered, and it's a really important question, is should any media company be allowed to publish whatever they want and have a right to Twitter or Facebook to be able to propagate that story? I would say yes, because the alternative is having some 
tech bro make those decisions for the media. I mean, the reason we have, look, if, if, if the New York Post was just spreading outright, totally fabricated stories, then they're going to gain a reputation of being a, you know, the National Enquirer of the National News. Um, and, uh, you know, people will stop taking their their story seriously. Like, it's not the tech company's responsibility to vet these stories for what's true and what's not. And by the way, I would say set the same standard for, like, when Jacob Blake was shot by the police in Kenosha, which, by the way, you know, just to remind you, sparked off riots where they burned down a full square block. The New York Times reported initially that he was there to break up a fight between two women and that the police came, or and then it was that he was delivering a birthday cake to his kid or something, and then the police just came and shot him in cold blood, right? Total, total, complete, like, total bullshit story. Do I think that the, that Twitter should have censored that story and said, that doesn't sound right? The police wouldn't just come and shoot a guy who's going there to break up a fight between women, two women. No, I don't think it's on Twitter to, to make that decision. Same thing with the New York Post story. Like, sure. I don't think that is the t- Twitter's uh, mm-hmm. uh, role to adjudicate. Okay, sure. And I don't even think I necessarily disagree with you. All I'm trying to say is that there are very strong and compelling arguments on the other side that I think can't just be hand-waved with while well, they're acting in bad faith and they're doing horrible things, right? I might be a person that is a major investor in Twitter. I might be the CEO of Twitter. I might be hyper manager of Twitter. And I don't want cities burned down because of misinformation spread on my platform. And I don't think that's a hard buy. Like, that, I think that's pretty easy to understand that somebody would be like, hold on, um, a couple of clips were posted. We think that these clips are actually super out of context, which all the Jacob Blake clips were, the initial ones, were like 10 second long clips of a guy just getting shot in the back for no reason six times. That's what everybody thought initially, right? And right. I don't think it's necessarily the worst thing in the world if a social media company is like, you know what? No, we're, we're, we have a policy. We don't allow this type of stuff to be propagated on our platform. Now, I think there are legitimate arguments on the other end. Well, hold on. Who are you to decide what is allowed and what isn't? How are you, um, as David pointed out, and his three points in his thread, there's a lot of introduction of potential political and other biases that could influence what ends up on a social media platform or what doesn't. But in a conversation about First Amendment rights, I think it's important that we understand that the, the platforms themselves have a right to some extent to dictate what type of stuff they want on that platform. And if you don't want that type of misinformation spreading and causing actual material harm and death in the United States, I agree that it's okay to push back against it, but I don't agree it's okay to go and just be like, oh, well, they're just doing because they're ideologically partisan and they hate the United States and they hate freedom. I think there are legitimate reasons to push back against this kind of stuff. I want to make a really boring, nuanced argument, which is that um, I think that there are, we live in the real world where there are trade-offs to everything, right? And I agree with you that if you allow anybody to post whatever they want to at any time Mm -hmm. on these social media platforms, there are going to be negative consequences to it, Mm -hmm. obviously. Um, I think we have to choose between a world in which um, we suffer those negative consequences, just like we suffer negative consequences to free speech in a democracy that people are going to abuse and they're going to be Holocaust deniers or whatever, and they're still going to be have that speech constitutionally protected because we've made the decision that even though there are risks to, to allowing that kind of speech, it's worth it for a functioning democracy. So I would say that, yes, there are going to be negative effects. We'll never get rid of that. But then we have to look at the trade-offs of the alternative. And I think we've seen the trade-offs of the alternative. The Twitter files helps to reveal some of those trade-offs, which is handing over control over our discourse and over our speech rights to unelected um, corporate executives. Um, and there's a whole bunch of problems that come along with that, with that as well, even when they're trying to act on the best faith possible, which I think in most cases... Um, at Twitter, they were, although not in all cases, and you could imagine a situation in which it was another company where they were less disposed to making those decisions in good faith and were maybe more nakedly partisan, where you didn't have a Yoel Roth, who again, even though he's been villainized um, as a result of the Twitter files, I think was actually one of the heroic actors there because I think the guy had a lot of integrity in the decisions he made. That wouldn't necessarily be the case with somebody else. So like, I think that there are trade-offs to each, and I would say that the danger I mean, maybe this is the civil libertarian in me, but I think the danger coming from the government having its power over this stuff versus the unorganized masses, I would side with the unorganized masses and I would take that downside over the downside of handing over that control to Mm -hmm. corporate executives and government bureaucrats. Sure. Even I'm curious what process you would like to see, you know, because maybe we can, you can acknowledge that 
it was a little bit too heavy handed. Well, I don't but, have to. Jack himself has said that, right? I think it probably was, right? Okay. Yeah. So, 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 because it was obviously too burdensome for the government to go through the legal process, which has to do getting subpoenas, getting court, you know, doing that for each of these pieces of content. They couldn't handle it. That's why they didn't do it. That's why they just sent over huge, huge, uh, you know, spreadsheets. Um, so a lot of it has to do with the fact that social media is new and the legal process hasn't even caught up mm -hmm. to the velocity with which content flows through social media. So, you know, but, but that's a legal change that has to happen. Sure. Like that's not social media. It's not social media companies fault that the government hasn't caught up. Mm -hmm. So, okay. We've had this conversation for however long, it's been about an hour, I think. Okay, this is my issue with things like the Twitter files, okay? What Leighton just recently said and what you asked, I wish that was what the entire conversation was about. Instead of like, Twitter is this partisan hack company that the FBI is trying to use to destroy Democrats and they're trying to get rid of the COVID misinformation because Fauci and Pfizer and the investments, it's all of these spots. I think that the conversation should be, the government is obviously gonna have some sort of input into the largest corporations in the United States. We would expect them to. We would probably want them to. We want the government to have some sort of insight into like what goes on at ExxonMobil, what goes on at Facebook. Like these are things that I think a general US citizen has an interest in. But there's also a legitimate interest in what type of input do they have? How public should that input be? Like how much transparency is there into that? And at the end of the day, like what should the ultimate say of the executive branch or any part of the government be for any of these companies? These are really good questions and we don't have any conversations about it. I, I feel like instead what ends up getting fixated on is like the hyper-partisan nature of everything that's being pushed and published about it. And then we basically just get into these huge conversations on like, was the White House trying to save the Biden presidency or not? Rather than, what is an appropriate amount of input the government should have for these platforms? Um, for Bill, like the question you asked, I don't even know what the right answer is. I think some additional level of transparency w would be good. Uh, maybe some sort of, you know, like how hedge funds and stuff have to publish positions in tax forms and stuff to, to show like what, you know, they're short on, what they're long on, what they hold. Maybe some sort of uh, publishing at the end of the year where uh, social media companies publish non-subpoenaed requests from intelligence communities. Like, hey, just so you know, this, maybe they might already do that. I just don't know it, right? But like, maybe like, hey, at the end of the year, this many requests were made by the FBI. Maybe there's some level of even public information about it. Like they, uh, you know, there were 400,000 accounts that they request us to look into, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that type of mandatory reporting, if there's any engagement between a federal agency and a, and a private firm happens, maybe that would be like a, a step in that direction, something to have that kind of transparency bill. Um, I one think, of, yeah, go ahead. Oh, one other key question, because you keep talking about the, the narrative mm -hmm. around Twitter files, and I'm very curious from Layton and David, um, you know, is it, how do you feel about the Twitter files being the name of all of these reports with different reporters. You know, you've got Elon having, you know, his two cents on it. You're all kind of getting lumped into this one brand, even though, you know, you may, you know, in, you know, Barry and Elon were even kind of feuding a little bit. You know, she wouldn't respond to him uh, when he was kind of trying to demand some answers from her. And so, like, I'm curious how, how that feels because I, I think it speaks to Destiny's point a little bit. Uh, David, I don't know if you want to take that first or second. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I was just trying to look it up right now, but um, I saw this guy, this um, California state senator, I forget his name, uh, Wiener maybe. Um, Scott Wiener. Yeah, I think he tweeted yesterday. Um, he said something about the Twitter files and this sort of Elon Musk, um, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something to the effect of Elon Musk, the Twitter files, right wing propaganda machine. And I'm like, that is just such an absurdist statement, particularly for, you know, for anyone to make, but in particular a guy who's a state senator you know, who has a large platform. I mean, I know just from talking with, with Leighton and the other guys, I mean, I, I don't think any of the, the reporters on the Twitter files are, are right wing, you know, I mean, we're all either, you know, blatantly liberals or independents, you know, politically. So the idea that this is this right wing propaganda machine is so absurd. None of us work for Elon Musk. He had zero involvement, at least to my knowledge, of anything that I was doing, any of my reporting. He functioned more or less as a whistleblower, I guess, in that role, but albeit a very unique one, um, where he gave us access to be able to do some searching on internal files of this company. That's it. He oh, he put the key in the door for us, but he had no involvement, as far as I'm aware, in, in any of the material that we were able to to look up. So I think, because I think the state senator's tweet sort of gets to, 
gets to to what to what you're you're arguing about this this notion of like the narrative the narrative the narrative well that that's to some extent a narrative that that you and other people are interpreting and by the way i think your questions that it's funny, this is a thing that journalists often talk about. They're, they're, after every article you write, there's always someone who tweets something. You should have written this type of story instead. And this is, sounds like, it's like, I appreciate that. You wish the story was something different, that it had a different angle. I, and I am interested in the questions you raised here in our conversation. I, I would love to see a larger conversation about that. But I think in order to even get to that conversation, we first, as investigative reporters, you know, in this function, were, were initially just bringing things to light to start that conversation. So I'm not opposed to that conversation. I don't even think necessarily I'm the appropriate person to, to be having that conversation. I don't have a stronger, you know, knowledge of, of the ethics and legal components of how these, you know, platforms should function necessarily than anyone else. So. I feel like there's just a few different things being conflated. You sort of revealed at the end that you wished the, the, this, this more philosophical conversation about what's appropriate um, was what the reporting really was on. But that's not necessarily what investigative reporting is. Uh, at least for me, in my reporting, I wasn't taking that type of stance. I wasn't trying to answer those questions because it didn't feel appropriate for me to answer them. I just wanted to bring information to people and then start the conversation from there. So I, I like this conversation. I don't have all the answers. I just wanted to, at minimum, in my role, at least during the Twitter files thing, was to bring this to light um, it, to the best that I was able. Well, I mean, I, I would just say, oh I would, I'm sorry, I would just say real quick in answer to your question that I, I think that it is unfortunate that Musk stipulated that Twitter be the platform upon which the, these revelations were first published. And you know, a lot of these were written afterwards in longhand um, uh, on Matt Tybee's Substack, on Michael's Substack, but on Barry's Substack, but um, of course, that's not what got the attention, right? What got the attention were the were the threads, and I don't think the format was the problem. I actually think that the format of the Twitter threads forced us to to make things really concise in a way that was actually good, um, a good discipline in writing. But the venue of Twitter, especially for a debate about Twitter, um, is just so polarizing. It's such a toxic space for this kind of discussion that of course if you publish that shit on twitter of course it's going to become the absolute partisan shit show that it became so i i we were we had to do that it was a condition of seeing those twitter files and i'm and i i wish it were otherwise i mean like that's the, these are like it's not just reporting um I, the ones that i prepared for the most were the um was that twitter uh, the thread, the I think it was thread seven with a Schellenberger. Um, like the final tweet has a quote from Jim Jordan, right? I have concerns about whether the government was running a misinformation operation on we the people. That's not just a reporting of fact. That's like a persuasive essay, right? This is like your huge hitter at the end here. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that like, well, of course it became partisan because of the format of Twitter. It was very clearly written with... I guess we don't have to call it a partisan slant, but at the very least, a particular narrative was definitely being pushed on in these tweets, which maybe we can say is any investigative piece is necessarily going to have that push if you want. Um, when you, I have a question uh, for David. W when you talked about uh, being given the keys, and I don't know how much you're at, at liberty to discuss this or not, or what's NDA or whatnot, like how were you able to investigate like Twitter emails? Like what was that process like? There were no NDAs, by the way. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. I have no. I had zero conditions. I'm happy to. to give any detail I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by that, that was obviously a metaphorical <laughs> sure. uh, explanation. Yeah, basically, Barry um, asked me to, she said, you know, you've been writing about COVID for a bunch of years. You know, we have access to Twitter. Will you come out and take a look? You, you're familiar with a lot of this. I said, yes, that sounds great. I'd love to see what's going on. So um, you can tell, I don't know how boring this is or the, the details, but I'll try to be, you know, relatively succinct. Basically, we were put in a room and people, um, there was an engineer there with us who had a laptop and the engineer was able to do searches um, that we requested on specific individuals on their profiles. And then within there, he could then dig in and look and see, oh, there's certain, um, you know, what type of labels are on different tweets or what, what, what's in the sort of like profile and the log files. Um, for for individuals. So that was one type of search that 
he was doing for us, like, you know, and I'm basically standing over his shoulder. Then the separate searching emails and um, Slack channel, stuff like that, we had to submit um, requests for specific, um, you had to have the names of specific employees mm -hmm. that you were looking for, and then a request for that name with, you know, if you had certain keywords or other stuff in a certain time frame. And then they sent that out to someone, I think it was on premises, but just not in the room with us. And then they would come back with a set, a different laptop that had those files. Um, and then we were able to look through them in, you know, in that fr uh, frame of time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I'm curious for this process, because earlier you said you were given the keys. I don't know how like technologically savvy anybody is here. Um, I'm not talking it down or up. I just, yeah, I maybe that wasn't it. the correct. No, yeah, sure. But as because, I just because I'm wondering, yeah, because I'm happened. wondering, like, because did somebody basically just like give you a file server and they were like, here's all of our internal communications, you know, have at it, good luck, search through everything. Um, the yeah, process that you I were, described it. Yeah, yeah, the process that you were given, if you'd felt like, um, if you'd felt like this was a, a process happening in the, in the White House or in some executive building where you went to see a laptop and there was an executive sitting there and he was doing the searches for you, or if you were to send off certain searches to somebody else and then you know somebody from uh, the, the CIA or somebody came back and they gave you an answer, do you, would you trust those requests and would you trust that all the information you're seeing is 100% uncensored, unedited, um, it's being shown exactly as it exists in the internal documents, or would you be a little bit more hesitant to believe it at that point? Well, I mean, it's hard to conjecture. I, I don't know, I've never been invited to the White House or the CIA and those are, you know, intelligence or you know the intelligence community i think has a different role than twitter i i will say using my judgment mm -hmm. um there was a guy who's sitting there doing searches it is possible that was a fake laptop with 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 manipulated information but i was watching him you know typing in and doing the searches it is also possible when we sent in a request for you know, we would like to see emails from such and such employees, you know, that discuss X, Y, Z topic. Mm -hmm. And then we send it out and then it comes back, you know, sometime later. It is possible they use some process to look through 2,000 or 5,000 emails, quickly pull out the things they didn't want us to see, and then give us the document dump. That is possible. That seems highly unlikely. Um, I mean, that would require a fair amount, a, a team of people to perform this in real time and to all keep the secret to, to manipulate the, the, the information in that way. I, I can't rule it out. I don't know if Leighton, if you have that. I mean, that, yeah. that was my observation. It was just like, well, to be just real quick, just on that and then Leighton, you can go. Because that was a really interesting answer. Um, to do what you just said, um, I could make a copy of an email database. I could host that internally. Um, and I could remove from that any employee that I don't ever want you to have access to. And then I could put you in front of an employee and have you search. I could I could probably figure out how to do this myself in 10 minutes. Not, it's not that, you could probably figure it out in 20 minutes if you don't have, even without much. Very easy to, to remove that piece of information, make a copy of the database, host it internally, and then somebody's just searching that. Not saying that that did happen, but it's interesting that you'd say the chances of that happening seem almost impossible, but the chances of a coordinated top-down FBI op, basically, where they're digging through information that Giuliani has about Hunter Biden and then using that to exert pressure on ex-FBI people in Twitter in order to get a story censored that's going to be negative to the Bidens for the election, that is, like, super plausible and probably is what happened. It's interesting well, the level of discrepancy between the both of Well, no, but you yeah, don't First of all, yeah. yeah, you're conjecturing that, that Twitter had some kind of conspiracy, but we actually have evidence for exactly the, the chain of events that we laid out around the Hunter Biden laptop. But just to provide some context, the reason why we weren't able to just access this stuff ourselves mm -hmm. is because is because they were paranoid. The lawyer at Twitter was paranoid about our being having seeing user data, which would be a violation of the terms of service and could get them in major legal trouble. So the all, the entire framework was around making sure that we had no access to seeing any user data. Mm -hmm. So in terms of so I don't think it was as much of a technological challenge as it was a legal thing. But also like we're talking about thousands and thousands of emails that we would be handed over. We the the twi unless Musk had a skunk team that was doing all of the work that we did before we did it, reading all of these emails and taking stuff out, then there was no time for the. It took hours and hours and days in some cases for us to go through all of these emails. They weren't able to do that, and then and then they didn't know what was in there. Plus, by the way, the people who were doing the stuff were not even. They were brand new Twitter employees. Most of them were brought in from Tesla and from SpaceX. So these were not people who had any particular 
vested interest in protecting anything at Twitter. And they were under directions from Elon Musk, from the boss, saying these were just engineers who brought in from, from Tesla or whatever, who Elon Musk said, do this. Mm -hmm. And then they did it. And then they gave it to us. OK, like, there's, I, there's no reason to believe that they had the capacity or the interest. Sure. In OK, I got to I have to push back. That statement is unbelievably wrong to me. OK, so Elon Musk, a guy who just spent, what, 44 billion dollars acquiring a social media platform, he has every interest in blowing out the old Twitter as much as possible. Absolutely. And the incentive is stronger there than in any other thing we possibly talked about in this conversation. Wait, wait, are you, are you, so, well, wait, 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 let me, just, let, me just, let me just finish real quick, okay? Because the incentive in the FBI is incredibly mixed because you're bringing a lot of different actors together on an executive uh, intelligence community that was, by the way, headed by Trump, ultimately. That was, this was Trump's FBI, right? With his appointed officials. Um, you're saying that these people were able to coordinate and conspire, but the idea that Elon Musk, who just spent all this money on Twitter and has every incentive in the world to blow the f out of the past uh, of the past like Twitter staff doesn't have the incentive there to lie now to be clear also I'm not saying that he did I'm not saying that you guys got bogus information ever but I'm saying it's easily plausible that something like that could happen but isn't it are you suggesting are, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry let, 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 just to clarify are you suggesting that he had staff go through all these emails and find stuff that looked favorable to old Twitter and delete those emails before we saw them? I'm saying that it would be trivial to do that yes how? And then, this is not something you could just do with an algorithm, I don't think, or like a keyword thing. We were like, I want to see the emails from such and such executive that mentioned myocarditis or something like that. And then they send me back 5,000 emails. How would they know which emails to, to, to delete or not get to us and then create a fake new file? Like, I mean, I guess it's, mm -hmm. I understand it's technically possible, but this, I think, would require actual human resources rather than than a yes. you know like a software program because they don't know without reading we had to read the things we were looking at we couldn't we were reading it to see what is of interest here what's important what's not important mm -hmm. i don't understand how they would actually be able to um manipulate and send us fake bundles of emails that yeah sure that so like i don't know what i don't know what you saw so i i can't say exactly right but let's say that i've got a bit database of five thousand emails right and let's say that i know that you guys are doing a twitter file thing related to hunter biden right let's say that i search for biden okay uh, or let's say that i search for hunter biden as a keyword um let's say that this brings up maybe about a thousand emails now let's say there's two twitter employees and i really don't like these guys let's say that in the vast majority of the emails it's people saying things like oh like this story is um it's probably okay we thought well you know i don't think we should censor this blah 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 i just wipe out all the usernames of the people that i don't well, like we, we did see those emails i told you about y'all ross email saying this doesn't violate any of twitter's <clears throat> terms of service sure i'm just i'm we giving it i'm just giving i'm giving it i'm giving an example of how you could do this in an hour or or less. But it would be very easy to do it. The information we got does not reflect this hypothetical example you're describing. We got thousands of emails, most of which were non, you know, incriminating, many of which showed Twitter acting in what I, you know, tried to describe as an admirable manner that they were trying to figure out. Sure, but you wouldn't cases. you wouldn't know. You got what they gave you. You got what they allowed you to search for. Which again, I'm trying to be clear, I'm not saying that you right. got bogus emails, but I'm saying it's super mm -hmm. plausible that it could have happened. And it's interesting say, to me but, that, that but if you were in the we're... White House and the CIA was giving you stuff, you'd be like, I'm not sure if I got everything. I need a Snowden guy on the inside to tell me. Like you would be hypercritical of it. But when Musk gives you things, you're like, oh, this must be everything. And then I'm gonna publish what I find here. All right, why is it assumed that there was no liability for Elon to release all this information? I think, I think the opposite. You could actually assume that Elon is and Twitter are taking on liability by putting this information out because potentially all these, I mean, look what happened with Berenson. I mean, he had a serious lawsuit against Twitter. Now you're opening up thousands of people could potentially have lawsuits against Twitter. So it's not necessarily, like, yes, there are favorable aspects to doing this, but it's there's definitely legal risk. No. It's absolutely favorable. Elon's whole position on the company was Twitter was ran as a hyper-partisan BS establishment that was just a tool to politicians, um, and I'm going to come in and I'm going to change that. And part of changing that is, is being unprecedentedly transparent about what happened in the past. All of these Twitter files, of course, have played favorably towards Elon Musk trying to illustrate that picture. That's the goal, right? Right, but users could sue him. I mean— Sue for what? I mean, well, look at Berenson's suit. Well, Prior Berenson— Wait, that guy's not Twitter, though. Yeah, he is. He is Twitter legally. No. He's the same. <laughs> no, but he sued Twitter for banning him. 
Uh, well, I mean, how, anybody can sue. Anybody can sue Twitter for banning them. Absolutely. I mean, that, that case isn't going to go anywhere, probably, right? I imagine. Uh, he. Wait. I think he settled with them. Settled. He got reinstated. <laughs> he, he successfully was let back onto the platform because of his lawsuit, and he settled. It could have, you know, there could have been much more damage if he hadn't settled potentially. But I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of new people who potentially have grounds. Maybe there's a class action, something that comes out. Who knows? I mean, there, there is risk. Wait, so let's, I'm just curious on a macro level. Hold on, I'm curious. How many of you guys think that Elon thought these pi files were going to be positive versus negative? Do you really think he's like 50-50 it could go either way? No, I'm just saying there was, it's not as if there was no risk to him. Well, I mean, there was a lot of risk in buying the company. There's always going to be some level of risk, of course. But I mean, like, for, for the most part, he thought that this was going to be massively positive PR for his new Twitter acquisition, right? Of course right? he did. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, another point of context to understand is that Twitter at the time, at that moment, was like half, 50% staffed and falling apart. And they were trying to keep this company, like they, in fact, we were like getting a lot of pushback from the engineers because they're so irritated that they had to spend so much time with us because they were literally trying to keep this company afloat, mm -hmm. which was, it was like a shit that was falling apart. So like the idea that they could even spend any more time with us seems unrealistic. But to answer your question about the CIA, like uh, and to a certain extent, like you could, the question that you're asking, you could ask about any story ever written. Like if you do a FOIA request to the CIA and you get a bunch of stuff back and a ton of it is redacted, but there is some stuff in, in there that you report on, is it possible that the CIA was breaking the law and not entire giving you all the records and like finding some, some stuff that was even unredacted, they just didn't even hand over to you? Yeah, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Like you can always come up with a theory that there's that, that your sources are somehow lying to you, but like it's a it's a it's a disingenuous question. It's like well, to a certain extent, at some point it. you just have to say, okay, this is the information that we have to go on, and we're going to be as transparent as possible about what the process is. Mm -hmm. And if you want to come up with like a counter example about how this could have all been doctored, you're entitled to do so, just as you could do with any story on Earth. Yeah, okay, so my question is not disingenuous. What I worry about sometimes is um, is hyper-selective skepticism. Um, if the CIA, if you FOIA request and you know it doesn't seem to match up with a lot of the reporting that you've done or a lot of the investigation you've done, I think it's totally fair to be like, I don't know if I'm getting everything that I wanted to get or I feel like something is off here or some of my FOIA requests bounced, they didn't actually respond back to me or I the stuff is so redacted that this is ridiculous, I'm sorry. I, I think it's okay to have those thoughts. And I would expect if you're a journalist, you probably have those thoughts with almost everybody you talk to that of course this motherfucker is telling me exactly what he wants me to hear about his thing. And that's why you look for corroborating sources. That's why you look for people that sometimes have incentives aligned in other directions to see that like, okay, well, obviously you want me to believe this and this about your company. You're a major shareholder. Let me ask like a competitor or let me ask somebody else in your company's position differently, right? These types of things make sense to me. Um, when I when I hear selective skepticism and then on other ends, I hear like unlimited like trust. It's like, oh, we were given full access, blah, blah, blah. It just makes me wonder sometimes like, well, shouldn't we be skeptical of like all things, especially as journalists when we're given information by the companies themselves um, that we're going to do reporting on? I, I, you know, the people who we reported on are still out there and they're still vocal. Like I would think that if we were leaving out huge things that had been hidden from us, Vijaya Reddy or like uh, Yoel Roth or these people, Jim Baker would probably have said something by now, don't you think? They have. Jack. They're like, so no, Jack that's is not actually. How it happened at all? No, no. Jack has actually himself come out and he said, "Why don't you guys release all the emails that had to do with a lot of the communications?" Right. He himself has said, "Like there would be more context given if it wasn't just screenshots and snippets, but that a full conversation chance were released, people might have I mean, a no, different." No, no, no. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if there was stuff withheld from us that was crucial to tell the story that was left out, that was like withheld from us by Twitter. Don't you think the people who we were specifically naming and reporting on would say, "Wait, wait, hold on." That's not how it happened. There's this email I sent that said the exact opposite of what you're of what you're reporting. Like those people are out there to 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 fact check our stories, and I haven't heard any of them saying that anything we reported was inaccurate. Um, I, I, mean, I don't know the specific statements of everybody involved, but I do know that Jack Dorsey has himself said that if the full email chains um, should have been released without filter, that people would judge for themselves because he felt like. Um, that, that's just an opinion. That's not. That's not. That's not taking issue with anything we reported. That's not saying this thing that you reported is inaccurate. Right. That. That's the thing I was going to chime. I mean, I can only speak for the stuff that I personally wrote about because there's obviously a lot of, you know, journalists who are. But what I wrote about existed. Like that happened. So mm -hmm. whether this 
hypothetical that you're saying that there was like a, you know, potentially theoretically, you know, a secret team in another room that was going through and pulling stuff out, even if that happened, what I reported on really happened. Um, that, that, that there were tweets that were taken down. I, I knew that because I knew about them ahead of time that these tweets were mislabeled and I wanted to learn about why. That was interesting to me. That's yeah. why I wanted to go there. I'm like, I had observed these things happening throughout the pandemic. So I wanted to try to figure out, see if I could have any information. Well, what actually was happening? Why did this tweet by that was, you know, labeling something, for, you know, that where someone was quoting from an academic journal um, and it was correct information. Why was that labeled? Why did that get taken down? Why did this guy, this doctor's account get um, suspended? So I, so, I mean, the things I was reporting were true. And now, if there's some additional information, that doesn't make this untrue. Um, that may paint a different picture, which I think is what you're worried about or suggesting that the overall narrative or framing you're saying, you know, is molded in a certain way. But um, I don't know. It's just this gets into such like a I, I don't know. I mean, would you prefer if there was like a disclaimer that I mean, Hold on, wait, to be clear, I'm, nothing I'm saying is, hold on, I'm gonna, let me lean into this, okay? Because I am a really techie person, okay? Nothing that I've said so far is beyond the scope. In fact, if I had to guess, you guys probably didn't have full access to everything. And I'm only saying that just because when that many billions of dollars are involved and you guys are being brought in to write what are, in, to some extent, a PR puff piece for Twitter, because it's kind of what's happening, right? As you're being brought in, you have to post it on Twitter. It's probably gonna have to play favorable to the new guy that just acquired Twitter. And when there are tens of billions of dollars- It doesn't have to play favorable. Yeah, that's it, false. That's we had well zero accusation. constraints were placed on me about what I could, look at as far as I'm aware and certainly what I could write about but you, but you but you don't know that because you don't you don't have you didn't have unrestricted access to the database right and you said that, it yourself you had to put true. in requests for some of those emails uh -huh. I was there for three days it was like you know I think Schellenberger called it a smash and grab it's like here's what you can try to look up but the things that I wrote about mm -hmm. were, unless it was like an entirely fabricated uh, back end that I was looking at that was like a fake thing these were the That's files from the log file like I was looking at them. These were real emails. Sure. And real I think everything you saw, yeah, and I think everything you saw was real. I'm not saying it wasn't okay. real, but I'm, but so, we have to be careful yeah. when there's like selective lights shined on things. One of my biggest criticisms oh. of um, of Assange leaking stuff about the Democratic Party was when it came time for him to leak anything about Trump, he said, oh, well, people don't like Trump anyway, so we're not gonna leak anything there. And it's like, well, if you leak selectively, it's sometimes worse than getting no leaks at all because now we think one side is really bad and the other side is really good. It might be that there's a lot of like tomfoolery that both sides are up but, to. So I'm not accusing- yeah, I'm, just because, I'm not accusing you of lying of anything. Yeah, go ahead. But in my reporting regarding COVID, I showed that this was Twitter's policy. Mm -hmm. was that the, the anecdotes that I included supported Twitter's policies about how they wanted to label or flag certain types of content related to COVID. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand what... Um, what other information, hypothetically, if, if, if Elon Musk had a team, you know, manipulating the stuff behind the scenes that we weren't getting, um, you know, a, a, an accurate portrayal of what was going on. I don't know what other information that I could have gotten that would have painted a, a different picture. Like the things that I showed supported what their um, stated policies were. You know what I'm saying? It, like, I felt like I was reporting something that wasn't um, it wasn't a mystery. It was rather something that just was, it was, people just didn't know the details about how this played out. And then this helped explain, here's the process that happened about why certain tweets were, um, were taken down or why certain accounts were, were suspended. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, no, like I said, I don't think you necessarily report on anything false, but it's hard to say what other information could have like shaded things a lot differently, right? Um, By the way, some of, these, yeah. some of these searches were also done directly in front of us. So the ones that were like gigabytes of, of emails or Slack messages, they had to go and run searches on. But the PV2 stuff, which is the profile viewer, mm -hmm. like they were literally taking, they'd look up the, the we'd say, look up this person who they'd never heard of. And they would look them up and then they would literally like block half of the screen with their hands, which is the part with the, with the, the that would violate their TOS mm -hmm. so that we could just see the flat, like with their hands. And then like, we'd be looking at the other half of the screen, which is show the history of flags on that account. And we were able to scroll down. They were doing that right in front of us, sure. like spontaneously. There's no, there was a hundred percent transparency other than blocking half the screen so that they weren't. 
yeah, okay. you know, so giving us privileged information about users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think broadly the thing that I asked before is just it would have been nice to see, I guess, a lot of the um, like fuller email chains released. I know that Jack had made that request. Elon himself said that they were going to um, release everything. I don't know if he changed his mind on that or if it just hasn't happened yet. Um, and I also know that like some of the ex Twitter execs that were that were saying anything were getting like death threats. I think um, that there were stories about that that some of the ex execs at Twitter were getting insane. I think one of them had to move houses. Um, Y'all so, off. Oh, that's, it might have been. It right. might have been Yol Roth. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah. like, it, so when you say like, well, why wouldn't these other people speak out? I mean, maybe that could be, maybe not. But yeah, well, Steve, I think it's yeah. Go ahead. Are, are, it seems like all the more reasons to speak out. Are you what? really saying that you think that this amount of transparency is not ideal? Like, are you saying like you, you said a statement before like getting you know limited access is worse than no access? And I just I, I feel like let's just at least get on the same page with you know mm -hmm. what want for social media transparency moving forward. Like I think that generally speaking, regardless of politics or anything, uh, this is a positive step towards uh, social media transparency and other platforms, it would be good if they did a similar thing. I, they're probably not going to and this, that's why this seems to be somewhat of a unique situation mm -hmm. where no one is gonna buy Facebook or Google. It's not even possible. Sure. So the fact that this transaction even occurred and there was an independent party that came in and was even willing to do this, it seems like an anomaly. Okay. Let's say that there's a room full of 100 people, okay? And somebody walks up and he said, there's 100 people in that room. And I go, yeah, there are. And he's like, how many of them play basketball? And I'm like, I have no idea. Um, I actually, I just don't know. I truly don't know. Let's say that I walk into that room and I pull one guy and I say, hey, do you play basketball? And the guy's like, yeah, I do. Then let's say I come back and the guy's like, hey, how many people uh, do you think play basketball in the room? And I go, uh, probably all of them. I asked one and he said, so probably all do. If I'm extrapolating from that position, I was actually more correct when I had no information than when I just gathered a little bit of information. Um, I think that we have a big problem in our media reporting environment where sometimes people feel like getting small snippets of information is better than nothing. But I think the problem is small snippets of information can actually send you down a more misleading direction than just not having any of the information at all. And that's the kind of stuff that I try to look out for sometimes. I'm a little bit that's worried. A weird, I, that's a weird portrayal. Of, I mean, we were given gigabytes of information that took us days to, to, to scroll through and we were only touching the stuff that we the searches that we we're asking for we could ask for anybody and they would come back with with all those returns so like unless your theory that we were like treated to a curated Potemkin village of data is true then this seems like the opposite of what you're talking about um okay so um I feel like you're it, not even actually arguing this point. Well, okay. <laughs> I feel like you sort of are, but aren't really. You're sort of arguing it for the sake of arguing it a little bit. Hold on. Okay, I'm trying to be polite, okay? If I was a journalist and I was tasked with doing something like this, okay, I'm never in my entire life gonna write a story about a company based solely on the information the company gives me, full stop. I can't even, if I think really long, maybe, but I cannot think of a single example that would ever break that model in my mind. I am never going into Exxon's offices, having one of their engineers show me what they've done and then publishing a story on Exxon, on Exxon's platform released on their website about Exxon. I would never do that. That's called PR. I don't do PR for people. If I was a journalist- Would you not do a story on the CIA based on records from the CIA? Absolutely not. You would corroborate. You would investigate. Maybe the CIA says that we've no, got information. No, no, I'm talking about raw data. Like, oh, oh no, like not only you corrupt. You... between CIA agents. No, you would probably reach out to the people for comment, or you would reach out to affected parties, or you would reach out to any other type of like, a, let's say that you found these emails going through some email system, you'd reach out to the emailers to verify or something, right? You would always corroborate. I would not... If the CIA released stuff and they said, hey, here's exactly what happened with JFK and here's seven emails for it or whatever, I wouldn't go, oh, cool, it's settled. And you guys wouldn't either. You'd say, hold on, I want to see who you were talking to, I want to see who delivered these letters, I want to find out, I'm going to corroborate this every saying, because I'm not going to, why would I only trust, that. what? We had all that. We had all of this information. We had all the raw data. That's what we were reporting on. But you only like, were reporting on raw data from Twitter. And unless I missed it on some of the other threads, the threads were yeah, about we Twitter were from information on, gotten from Twitter. We were reporting on the internal deliberations on by Twitter employees on this on these events and on and on these flag tweets and the meetings with FBI. All of that information was in their Slack messages. Mm -hmm. It was in their emails. It was like I don't know. Like so, here, so here's a question: the meet, going back in time and bugging yeah. their offices. Like I don't know what else we would. I can think of so many other things. About. So here's like a really easy question, and I might have missed it in the threads, but also, at any point in any of these Twitter threads, was anybody from the FBI contacted and asked for comment? Wouldn't that be like a uh, really don't... easy way to like expand on like, because if you've got emails from people working at the FBI, why not like reach out to them? It's like, hey, you sent this email about this. Why not give me some more information on what this was about? 
I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. Uh, I haven't asked each of the reporters if they've emailed Elvis Chan. So I don't know mm-hmm. the answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, like, that seems it would be, um, be like a starting point. Because maybe the FBI, and like, the, the nice thing about that is, you might be able to build something even more nefarious. Maybe you maybe you ask an FBI guy, like, you emailed this thing. What was that about? And maybe the guy tells you, like, well, in the FBI, we actually have a program where, you know, we it, do this particular... Now, I don't have really much information, but I'm just saying like, that might even give you better leads to even more, like, foul play that's going on, potentially, you know? It feels like what you're saying is that, I, is that based on the possibility that this is a... that we were given... Like uh, this was an elaborate hoax and conspiracy by the FBI to pull the wool over our eyes. What we reported was therefore ipso facto a puff piece for Twitter and that we were just doing Elon Musk's PR for him. Yes, that's what I think. (laughs) Yeah, I find that like wild and also offensive. Like, do you think we have no integrity? Like we're going well, there. I, and if I was writing a story about something, I would of course reach for out for Elon Musk. Yeah, of course. It's we're go- the Twitter files are Elon Musk. Sell- yeah, I mean, like, it feels like that's yeah. essentially what's because he's an interested party. Do you think that any re- investigative reporter reporting on anything is not getting their sources from interested parties? Not everybody only you cor- corroborate information. Everybody who leaks information has an agenda. Everybody who meets you in a parking lot in a dark parking lot to give you mm-hmm. secret information has an agenda. Yeah. Every source you you get you get information from has an agenda. The difference here is that Elon Musk's agenda was transparent and known to everybody in the world. Well wait wait what is everybody Elon knew wait, wait, what, his agenda what is Elon Musk's agenda? To discredit the old Twitter regime. And more specifically his interest is to earn money, right? His interest is to grow the value yeah. of Twitter as a company, right? Part of that project is having journalists come on and write pieces on his platform about Twitter. So ostensibly, you're doing public relations for Twitter to try to grow the value of the company. You're functioning almost as like a, yeah, like a PR agent for Twitter. That's essentially what it is, right? No, no, it's there's, no, con- no there's no contract in regards to that at all. So you can't just throw the label PR at something that there's no PR contract. That, that's not what the agreement was. May, I, may, I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine. I can never imagine reading communication with people, not reaching out to anybody for comment, and then publishing all of it on the platform that's giving you the information. That seems like PR to me. That's that's what it feels like. I, I, I could be wrong, but that's. Yeah, I, I think it's it's crazy to assume that comments were not requested throughout the Twitter files. I, I, I would almost guarantee that's not true. And not a single person in any of these things had anything to say about them? That they means- did. The FBI responded. I mean, the FBI responded. Responded so- is not got a, got dig, did more digging or got a request for the story. Well, of course people responded to that. what their comments are? We have their unredacted data. We have their communications. Like, you could ask for their opinion. They could put their spin on it. But the, 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 the data is what the data is. Right. It, it might have been their emails. We have their Slack messages. Yeah. I mean, I can speak to my reporting, which is just that, like, this stuff happened. I sort of worked backwards. I knew there were a bunch of, I had a list of, you know, a hundred miles long of different tweets and different accounts that were flagged along the way. And I wanted to deconstruct to understand for myself and for the public how this happened. Um, so there was no one for me to contact. I already knew, you know, I, I was in touch with these people. I mean, the, the evidence was what it was. I mean, mm-hmm. I communicated with several of the people whose tweets and accounts were, were affected that I reported on. Um, and so I guess one of the things is, there's a whole variety of reporting that you mentioned, which is a good point in the beginning. Um, um, how do we feel about having everything under the umbrella of the Twitter files? You know, because there's a variety of different things being reported. So maybe they, in, at, in one sense, they do all belong under one umbrella. And in another sense, there's, you know, we're sort of merging a bunch of things together. but. Other than the stipulation that the reporting first has to go on the platform of Twitter, there was no relationship that I had with Twitter. There was no financial arrangement. There was no agreement. There was no NDA. It was just like the anomaly of this ultra rich billionaire buys the company and is like, here, I'm giving you access, you know, with these particular very tedious tools to try, you know, to, to, look up what happened, how were decisions made Mm -hmm. um, prior to my arrival. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing that I reported on that's possibly in dispute that I'm aware of. Like it it literally happened. I mean, I've had people write articles on me. Usually if I'm an affected party, at least somebody emails me like, hey, this is being published by end of day tomorrow. Do you have a comment or whatever? But yeah, I mean, I understand if it's a different way of going about things. 
Well, at least with my reporting, there was no one for me to reach out to. I mean, there was an email fr- you know, that happened internally, unless we are questioning the actual veracity of the email itself, that it was a, a, a fabricated email that Elon Musk's team made up in, in the part of this you know, thousand email file that it was fake. Aside from that, there was nothing, the reporting w- for me was on what happened at Twitter, what decisions were made, and how did this process take place that led to certain information, certain content on the website being flagged or suppressed in one way or another. Sure, yeah, I and understand. I wanted, but again, yeah. even for like, so did you ever reach out to Michael uh, Kratzios or whatever? Is that how you pronounce his name? I did not. Yeah, so like this was a guy who you said was from the twi- Trump White House that was specifically making calls to combat misinformation around 5G tel- cell phone towers, uh, runs on grocery stores, misinformation that could stoke panic buying. That seems like a really interesting guy to talk to. Like, well, when you guys are making these specific requests, how were they made? Like, maybe he says something to you where he's like, well, when we go to Twitter and we ask him about this, if they don't cooperate, they know that subpoenas are coming later and we don't pay them for subpoena work. Like an answer like that would be like, oh my God. Now, if you'd reached out to him and he said that, and now you've got a blue haired asshole like me asking you, what do you mean by pressure? You could say, well, actually, Destiny, Michael Kratzios from the Trump administration told me that if they don't get cooperation from Twitter, when we make these requests that we pay them for, we actually come in with subpoenas afterwards and that work is way more arduous for them. So they kind of do have to like that would be oh then I'd be like oh well yeah you, you got me there I guess like that does sound like a form of like soft pressure that would be real um I, I guess I, like that, I those think, are the um, comments that would be like really interesting to see yeah I I agree with you 100% on that mm-hmm. I think it would have been better if I had reached out to him I don't know if I would have gotten a reply oftentimes sure. as a journalist I mean more often than not when I'm writing something particularly with government officials mm-hmm. I'm usually met with either a no comment or literally no reply at all sure but I think you're 100% right I think it I think it would have if I had been able to connect with him and get him to respond to that characterization I think that would have been better. Mm-hmm. You're right. I mean, hey, look, it's not over. Like those those requests. Right. I still could reach out to him. Yeah. So sure. you're right. I wish I I wish I had done that. Um Destiny. I think I I think I'm totally with you on that. And Stephen, I'm curious like are you glad the Twitter files are out? Um kind of, but I I have to like I have to extrapolate for it. One of the worries, so I'm gonna have the exact opposite conclusions of you guys, but one of my worries was there was a, there was actually a whole bunch of like super partisan bullshitty behavior that was going on inside Twitter that when certain accounts were showing up that Jack and others were like Republicans, like we're gonna take these accounts offline or whatever. But instead, despite some of the headline tweets, what I actually saw was I was pleasantly surprised with how much discord was happening inside Twitter as they were trying to navigate the incredibly complicated media environment that was our prior presidential election season. I mean, and, over, yeah. I was too. Over, I was too. Overall, overall, the rebellion within Twitter was relatively small. There I mean, was a lot of conversation, but like they were literally on the um, Hunter Biden. They were literally saying like, should, like if we censor this on the hack materials, does it even really qualify for that? Like we're not sure. Like there was, it was some pretty hardcore. It was way more than I expected to find. I thought it was just going to be like, a, yeah, this is like it looks really bad, and I don't think we should have this on our platform and just censor it. They were going really hard, and also I expected that they would have kowtowed to the IC way more than they did too. I didn't know that the FBI was shooting off these huge lists to Twitter, and they were like, ah. F- the FBI, we're not banning these people. I don't even see good reason to. I was really surprised. I wouldn't have expected to see that from inside Twitter. Maybe because I've listened to so much conservative media, I thought they were all more way hyper-partisan than that. And they would have just been banning whatever was shipped off to them from the FBI. So I was pleasantly so, surprised, so, but yeah. So what you're saying is that we told a nuanced story, a complex human story of what was happening in this, in this organization. No, I'm saying that I had to read in. I had to read in deeper and use a little bit of extrapolation to get there because every single or 85 percent of the people that read the Twitter profile, or I'm sorry, the Twitter files, came away the exact opposite opinion that I have. We're not responsible for what people conclude on Twitter based on like a cursory reading of what. All we're responsible for is what we reported, and the stuff that you read that led you to the Quebec conclusion were screenshots of emails that we posted. Um, yeah, we, just have, we have a totally found, different view. I would say you're, I would say you're absolutely responsible. Um, I think we are responsible. Like we exist in, like if I'm writing a piece, the only reason I'm writing that piece, I'm not just like shooting stuff out into the ether. I want to communicate an idea that I have in my brain based on what I found to you. And if I'm trying to communicate something and over half the people are walking away with an idea that's incongruent with what I'm thinking in my mind, I failed as a, as a writer. That's, that would be my feeling on it. But uh, We're responsible for what we report and what we write. Like, if you can find stuff where you say, this is wrong, this is factually wrong, what you wrote, you wrote a lie, then absolutely, we own that. But I haven't heard you say that. 
what you're saying is is the overall thrust in the ether in the zeitgeist of the twitter files led some people to a conclusion which is hyperpartisan when in fact the story was much more complicated and there was in fact internal twi- uh, pushback within twitter etc cetera, etc cetera, all of which you gleaned from our reporting well, so to be clear, I opened with that the ending conclusion to Schellenberger's Twitter thread, the one that I thought we were going to focus on today, that we kind of did, um, is when he said, in the end, the FBI's influence campaign aimed at executives at news and media, Twitter, and other social media companies worked. They censored and discredited the Hunter Biden laptop story. I would consider that statement a lie. It's all true. What, what's a lie in it? That the FBI had an influence campaign aimed at they censoring and discredit. They did have an influence campaign. We've gone over this five times. They They... They knew that the Hunter Biden laptop was real. They knew that the story was legitimate, but they went on a tour of all these social media companies. They had meetings with top level executives saying that a big disinformation dump was coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then the Twitter files, uh, I'm sorry, then the Hunter Biden laptop story in the New York Post came out. Mm -hmm. It was censored. And then the IC organized a bunch of like former retired uh, uh, intelligence people to say this has all earmarks of of a Russian disinformation op after it was censored. That sure. sounds so, like an influence campaign to me. It, that might be, but the o- earlier I asked about evidence, you said you've given me evidence. The only evidence you've given me is a timeline. I don't know what you want. Like you, Any you, other you part, piece of evidence? You want to come out and say, I'm a conspiracy theorist? It could like, be elite. I, I, it, like, I orchestrated this whole conspiracy. Lock me up? Like, uh, like it, what, we, we've given a timeline. There's, there's documentary evidence to show each point. We've of the laid timeline. it out. Mm-hmm. You can run your, you can, you can come up with your own conclusion, but you just said that our referring to, to that series of events as an FBI influence campaign is a lie. Well, an FBI influence campaign to censor and discredit like politically partisan material. Like, of course, there's an. They in- absolutely ran an influence campaign to censor and discredit the Hunter Biden laptop story. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly what I just laid out. That, that is a series of events that I laid out was an influence campaign by the FBI who knew that the story was real to discredit a true story mm-hmm. to people who didn't know, who didn't have access to, to these uh, social media execs who did not have access to the information, who had no choice but to just take the FBI's word for it, and it worked. You they said not, no, we, well, you just said no choice but to take the FBI's word for it? I mean, they had choice, They, but I, we're kind of going back and forth they, they, on they, this. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't, they had no information with which to say, no, I think you're full of shit. So at that at that point, the FBI comes to your office. They say, "We have we have reason to believe that this Russian disinformation dump is coming." Yeah, you really have no choice. You can say, "I you're there." They FBI, do it. Stop saying they have no choice. Line. They did have a choice. They rebuked the FBI at so many different steps based on all of the reporting I'm on here. Saying they had they had no information with which to doubt the FBI's version of events, and the so the, which puts the FBI at a big advantage, saying this story is coming. We think it's prop- We think it's Russian propaganda, mm-hmm. referring to a true story that they know to be true. Okay. And that story comes and it got censored. Even even if Twitter did have choice, Stephen, they it doesn't change that the veracity of the last statement. If the FBI had an influence campaign to censor, and hey guys, I'm sorry, I need to. Um, I'm oh over yeah, yeah. My we can ra- we can wrap this up. Yeah, that's right, because we're kind of circling yeah. around it too. I, I want to yeah. you guys give a shout out to your stuff at least if you're yeah. Um, for David, okay. if you want to, yeah, if you have to, if to take off, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm on Twitter and uh, Substack, David's like at Substack or whatever, however the phrasing is. Okay, cool. <laughs> Stay Great <up>. plug. <laughs> That's like the worst <laughs> plug. <laughs> you need a more like a spelling friendly like last name. I feel like it'd be hard to look your <laughs> look your stuff up. E W E I G. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm on Twitter at, at L Woodhouse and my uh, Substack is public.substack.com. And uh, by the way, this got heated, but I really appreciate the conversation and I enjoyed it. Yeah, I appreciate it for you guys too. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And thanks, Bill, for bringing it all together and everything. Yeah. yeah hit up, uh, if you want to come to the Austin event uh, and kind of go uh, next level on this, check out festival.minds.com and you can get tickets. We'd love to have you. Yeah, yeah real quick. Um, if Layton and David want to take off, we can chat about that for a second, Bill, if you want to plug the event sure. more. Yeah. Yeah. Your hangout, yeah. Thanks, nice, Steven. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate okay. the conversation, I, guys. Yeah. I like being pressed on all these issues. You ask interesting questions and push it in interesting uh, directions. So I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate the conversation, guys. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Bye. Later. So this is an event that I'm going to be at. I think at least one of these guys was going to be there as well, right? Layton. Layton is going to be there too. Um, yeah. Yeah. What other big ticket debates? Who else is going to be there? Sell it to them. Make them buy tickets. So we've got on that panel. Um, let's see. 
So that panel is you, me, we got Brian Callen, Layton, and Pasovic. So, you know, you, I, the, the Pasovic element in that <laughs> will be very fun because, it, you know, you, I'm sure he's pushing the narrative that you're discussing. And then mm-hmm. earlier on, we're doing just like a, a, change, a change of my mind with audience members. So anyone out there who wants to try to hop on stage, you know, mm-hmm. not, not too many people are going to be able to come on, but we're going to do some of that. With uh, Chris Williamson, who's got a really cool podcast. Oh, I'm doing a show with him before the event, actually. Yeah, people have seen me on his show. He's a really cool guy, yeah. He's really cool. Also, mm-hmm. Peter Rosian, Daryl Davis, and uh, Matthew Israeli, from, uh, who's the founder of the Post Millennial. So that'll, that'll be like more freeform, but I think it's going to be really interesting. Mm-hmm. We've got one uh, talking about social media moderation with uh, Eliza Blue, Ian Crossland, and, and Luke Rodowski. And you, if, 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 if you want to be on that one, too. I don't know if you've seen uh, all of the nonstop trending of uh, the Eliza Blue situation. Uh, I've, I got linked to articles, and it, honest to God, looked schizophrenic to me. So I, have, I don't even yeah. know anything about any of that shit. Holy <laughs> before any of that exploded. Uh-huh. Um, and so it's kind of just been an, an interesting thing. And We'll see. We'll see what happens. We're going to try to lay, lay out both sides as as much as possible, but it, mm-hmm. it's on nuclear. It's really insane. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, um, that's a killer lineup for the event. I've linked it. I'll link it again in chat. Uh, I will be there if you guys want to buy tickets. Um, in uh, I think it's April fifteenth. April fifteenth. Yeah. Cool. April fifteenth, uh, which is a Saturday. Cool, man. Yeah. Thanks for having us. I, th- I think that was a great debate. I mean, yeah. I enjoyed. It, it was yeah. super fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't piss anybody off too much but <laughs> no, I think it'll be interesting to decide like what we can come up with in uh, in, in between now and then mm-hmm. to kind of maybe get to a better place like I also think I, I'm curious if you still are you sticking to the fact that you think that last line was a lie like 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 I feel like the saying lie is a little bit volatile <laughs> to be honest here this is my this is my this is my world philosophy okay I think that the biggest problem that we have right now in the, in Western politics, probably in worldwide politics, is we have a really hard time understanding each other's motivations. When liberals want to expand the power of government, it's because they want to have a dystopian future where they control your life. And when Republicans want to take back power from government, it's because they want homeless people to be dying on the streets because they they hate homeless people. Um, we, we ascribe these horrible motivations to everybody. And I, I guess when I read through some people that are writing peace on each other, I like to start from the point that, and I've gotten so many emails from people working in intelligent c- communities. They're like, most of these dudes, like they show up to work, they want to do these jobs, they want to do their best. And like, yeah, like sometimes weird stuff happens, but for the most part, everybody's trying to do a good job. So when people present these things as like these huge conspiratorial things where the FBI is moving in this hyper-partisan way to try to like do this really malicious action, it's like, oof, like, like, that could happen, but I need really strong evidence for that claim. And without that evidence, we're all just kind of like driving each other into these holes. And I think that there's so much evidence out there that shows that like Twitter and the IC are legitimately trying to do the best job they can. They are really scared of all this crazy foreign misinformation of all these companies being set up in the US. And like sometimes people make mistakes, unfortunately. I think the censoring of the Hunter Biden story, I think that was a mistake. Jack Dorsey said it was a mistake. I think most people agree that they probably shouldn't have ever cut it from Twitter. But um, reading so maliciously into it just like primes everybody to can hate each other and I'm, I try to push back on that when I can yeah I just I think that they're they don't have the authority to just create their own process out of nowhere and they have to like the law has to evolve so that a new process is created like just because oh they're in good faith like trying to handle this craziness of uh, foreign influence and COVID and like that doesn't mean they can just manufacture a new process so that that's one one last point and then the other mm-hmm. thing I wanted to mention was you know because at the New York City uh event last time you mentioned like these events are constantly just anti-establishment people on both sides Mm -hmm. talking to each other and i just do want to say that i made very i'm still waiting here from nbc but i have a specific nbc reporter Uh who wants to come and made a request uh to come and he's still waiting on permission so i'll i'll say this i don't necessarily want to say his name right now but Mm -hmm. he said that they he already said that they said he can't speak Sure. And they, but he did request to come cover the event, in okay. which is still up in the air. So mm-hmm. point being like, we really are trying to hit up, you know, more kind of mainline media. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if anyone out there are, are listening and want to participate, just, you know, hit me up. Cool. Hit us up. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. See you later. Bye.
What um I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm crazy or not. I feel like um I feel like I went hard enough. I think that was hard enough. I think I went hard enough on that. I think I, I feel I feel pretty okay about that. I had to think a lot about it in the end there if I was going to start to pull back or not because I feel like I was like, when they started because you're you're doing PR for Elon, you are right. That's what you are doing. And the idea that you would do that for any other company that like okay we're gonna write we're gonna write a piece on Exxon Mobil. Okay, cool. Well, what are you gonna do? Well, we've got three days. We're gonna go in a room with some Exxon um, engineers. We're gonna ask for some emails. They're gonna show us stuff. And then based on what they say, we're gonna publish a whole piece on that and their effects on the environment. And it's like, what? That's, why, that's wild to me. That's so crazy to me. What makes you go harder than usual or lighter than usual? How do you tell the line? I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. I just try to, I guess I just try to feel it out. I don't want to like shit on anybody. But like that's some pretty wild journalism. If it's just like, I didn't reach out to a single person for comment. All of the Twitter headlines are highly ideologically driven. And then to say, well, there's no agenda here. But they're like, I don't know. This seems a little. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, real quick. I just caught up on your, uh, the Hunter Biden shit. Cool. Um, yeah. What'd you think of that? What were your final thoughts on how that conversation went? Because I was really frustrated. Mm, I was pretty disappointed. I mean, I felt I did pretty well, but it was uh, <laughs> pretty amazing. Yeah, I, no, I think you did very well, but the the big one, kind of going in reverse order, just want to make some observations here and then I'll fuck off, but mm -hmm. not believe. I mean, I didn't think about it either, but it sounds like none of them reached out to any of the FBI agents or any of the witnesses for like a comment or follow up. And then at the very end, one of the guys was like, you know what, that might've been a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I'm After not, pushing I don't back on it, yeah, I don't know what to. I don't know what to say about that one. To be honest, I don't know what. I don't know what. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to say to that. That's. If it was 2016, that neither of those guys would have wanted to talk to me ever again. I. Yeah. Well, no. It's an un, that's an un, that's an unfathomable thing to say. Do you understand that, right? 100% like it never even okay so this is this is how I guess how stupid I am I assumed just assumed that Taibi Weiss and others did reach out to the FBI and were just told to off by the FBI that's why we never got like any comment from them but oh I they assume they sound... didn't because they never in any of the things because if typically if a journalist does that they'll write they'll down no yeah they'll say reached out to him they didn't respond true oh, I cannot believe like if for the the I don't, the, the David Zweig guy finally bit the bullet and was like, you know what, that probably, that, I, you know, mm -hmm. if I could go back and do things differently, I probably, but you know, they, they never, typically, they either don't reach back out or they say no comment, but you know what, they, I, it would have probably made things better if I'd have reached out and done that, but uh, Woodhouse, like, just resisted, like, he, he thought it was just absolutely far-fetched. We have the raw data. We have the emails. Why on earth would we reach out to the FBI so they could put their spin on it? Yeah, I, I it was just a, amazing. It was just a, yeah. A, 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 yeah I, I don't. I, I can't. I just don't know. I can't even believe you would. Yeah, it's <laughs> like that. That that. If anybody's paying attention to that conversation you had, that should be national news. You know what I'm saying? Oh, guy adjacent. E Wait, Zweig was a Twitter files writer, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other guy is uh, Schellenberger's friend, roommate, associate or, or something. Partner. Yeah. That should be headline news. That clip should be on mm -hmm. MSNBC and CNN. Like Twitter files, Twitter files journalist comes up with innovative journalist strategy of, of not requesting confirming comment. or verifying anything with anybody about anything. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. Okay, two other things just to keep in your back pocket because apparently you're having another conversation about this in Austin. Yeah, apparently. Okay, and I will send you the links and I will send you the screenshots to so check your DMs, but now going in chronological order, mm -hmm. uh, Woodhouse was like, when he was making his narrative that the FBI was poisoning the well to Twitter that, hey, they had possession of the Hunter Biden laptop. And he says, unless the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing, they knew that the laptop was real. They investigated the laptop and then they spread this, 
you know, this rumor of Russian disinformation. But here's the thing. Elvis Chan, who was the primary FBI liaison to Twitter and Facebook and all these these groups, mm -hmm. he did say under oath, and I'll send you the link, he had no f***ing clue that the FBI had the laptop. They that he, he didn't work on it. It's a huge organization, like 10,000. Uh, would have been really good to know. I'd heard back uh, different things about that, but I wasn't sure 100% where the actual, like, uh, w where we were on that. So you're saying that the guy that was the liaison between Twitter and the FBI didn't actually know 100% about the... Correct. Oh. Under, he was asked, he said, okay, so were you aware, I'm reading verbatim, were you aware in 2020 that the FBI had Hunter Biden's laptop in its possession? Elvis Chan's attorney goes, objection lacks foundation. But then the guy asks again, did you know it at the time? And Elvis Chan says, I was only aware when the news media outlets posted it or published it. And then he goes on to say that Hunter Biden was never referred to by name in any of the conversations yep. in which he was in because he had no, he, again, he had no idea that the FBI had a copy of the laptop. And to your point, I don't even know if it is the laptop or if it was just a copy. It had to be a copy of the hard drive because the laptop repair guy still had one to turn over to Giuliani. Yes, because he made a copy of it before which is kind of weird in of itself but whatever right so I'll, again i'll send you the link the, on that i think that one of the it. most bad faith like one of the most easiest tests for like bad faith is like because and i'm i'll be clear i i am saying this it does seem to be that the laptop is real and everything relating to the laptop is real right sure. but you got to admit that's a sensational story like that sounds not real it sounds super fake right like hunter biden dropped off a laptop and forgot it at a computer repair store with a guy who was blind and can't see well. And a Trump supporter. Yeah, and a Trump supporter who shipped it. That's an unbelievable story. Now, it's real, and sometimes, like, really rare stuff does happen, but for somebody to look at that and be like, oh, no, that's, like, totally believable, 100%, of course. Why would you even think that? Like, come on, bro. Are you fucking serious? That's a fantastic story, you know? Well, well, I'll also send you another link. So the guy, the the repair guy, John Paul Mac Isaac, he's got like 17 first names. He's actually gone on the record where he's like, the reporting surrounding the laptop, he said, is freaking him out because there are there's information and images attributed to what he sees on the hard drive. He says that's disinformation and misinformation. He's kind of vague as to what it is, but even he is calling into question the veracity of like information that's associated with the Hunter Biden laptop. And mm -hmm. that's the guy who apparently has the fucking laptop. You know what I mean? Like, it, not only does it sound far-fetched, but in terms of the reporting surrounding it, even the, the key witness is like, yeah, some of this is sketch mm -hmm. that people are saying is, is part of this. And the New York Post themselves, the reason they hesitated to report, the, the guy who wrote the fucking article- Didn't even put, put his put, name on it? Yes. Or, yeah. yeah, like, yeah, anyway. So yeah, I'm, I'm preaching the choir there. I'll say also, again, did I'll it was it was the case that um did Giuliani shop around for that? I I remember reading it, but I couldn't find it that he was trying to get this published with other outlets and like they wouldn't. Yeah, Fox take News it. told yeah, him to Fox... fuck off because okay, they yeah. yeah yeah because he wouldn't they couldn't <clears throat> verify the authenticity of the the contents and I, apparently like Wait. the New York Times and the Washington Post they were Steven. like what I'm did you tell people you wanted to play League right now? No, <laughs> stop. My whole fan base is going to fucking revolt. Oh. I hear, speaking of playing games, aren't you still playing Factorio? No, I'm finished Factorio. Okay, okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to bring up to your attention was, um, oh, uh, the, the guy up in the right-hand corner, again, I think Woodhouse was his name. He, he was comparing, like, he did a whataboutism or like a false equivalence between 2016 Russian disinformation with something about the DOD running propaganda about the war in Yemen. Oh, yeah, I don't know anything about that, yeah. Well, I don't know anything about it either, but it's just like, even if what he says is taken at face value, surely he understands the substantive difference between, of Domestic course, our military... our DOD doing propaganda for the United States versus a foreign right. entity coming in. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> right, and not only just propaganda, but the purpose of the propaganda. The DOD wasn't trying to weigh in on a presidential election, right? Mm -hmm. Russia was trying to install their preferred candidate as our commander in chief, the most powerful man in the world. Like that is infinitely worse. Sure. Anyway, I'll send you the links on all of that. Um, and then uh, is the the Austin thing, is that just, are you debating Jack Sobiak? Um, am I debating? Uh, I think I'm on a panel with him, yeah. So we're probably gonna be debating, yeah. Okay, and is it, it's just a one day thing on that Saturday? Um, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. It's all listed okay. on the fucking um, on that website. Check it out. 
Okay. Well, I will probably fly down and attend that. Um, like, and I think uh, Luke Beasley, the guy you talked to, he's the David Cor- uh, David Pakman correspondent. He's mm-hmm. based out of Austin too. Um, so let's see if he'll go as well, and uh, maybe we'll link up over there. But okay. good showing, man. Thanks. I'll send you the links and everything. Have fun. Be careful, buddy. All right. See you, buddy.